Welcome, everybody. We are back with another action pack session on the Future Cannabis Project today. And this time we are talking communicating science to cannabis Welcome farmers everybody. and breeders. And, you know, oddly enough, both of our guests, well, they're pretty damn qualified to do this. Now, I want to start out with you, Ryan Lee, uh, breeding cannabis at breeding cannabis uh, on Instagram. You are a scientist, you are a farmer. You are a breeder. So you kind of encapsulate everything here. How are you doing tonight? I'm, I'm well. Thanks for having me on. Good. And then maybe, you know, in case people have missed your credentials before, you've got some great ones. You've been a regular guest here on the Future Cannabis Project. Uh, but maybe refresh anybody who's just tuning in to uh, the first time with you. Yeah, I'm a, I mean, I'm a plant breeder. I've been working with cannabis for, well, I don't know, 30 plus years at this point in time. Um, we've got an undergrad degree in neuroscience and studied plant breeding and biotechnology at like a post-grad level. Um, and I've worked in the cannabis industry kind of exclusively, um, you know, with some different groups and do it, done some pretty fun little breeding projects, you know, grown a lot of plants and analyzed them through a lab and, you know, a bit of tissue culture background. And so, yeah, we've, we've done a fair amount of stuff in the cannabis space and uh, learned a lot along the way so yes definitely definitely having it's been fun you know watching and learning from you too because you, you're very modest about these you know little projects that you do. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're they're you know they're very impactful um they point oftentimes to a lot of directions that we can go or things that we might not want to go so definitely want to dive into those as well in this conversation yeah i mean i've been lucky right i, I kind of started doing the science of cannabis well, definitely before it was legal in most places. And uh, maybe that just gave me a little bit of a head start. And then, you know, I, like I said, I got lucky to join some fun groups and we had a little bit of funding and the ability to, to do some breeding and build a lab and grow a bunch of plants. So, you know, if you do that, then you find some things, you know, everybody that's doing that, you know, I mean, look at Seth's group up in Oregon, the Oregon CBD group They're yeah. they're making all sorts of discoveries and finding things and developing, you know, new, new techs, new seeds that the market hasn't seen. So, you know, we haven't seen a lot of people putting money into the genetics of cannabis or actually, you know, breeding the plant or doing real scientific work on the plant. But if you do it, that's results, right? right. And uh, we're kind of at the point where, you know, we need to step up our game. The, it's a legal market and there's a lot of development to be done. And we, we're still learning as we're seeing. We're still learning things every day, right? Which is great. It makes it fun to do. And um, I mean, it's already grown a bunch of weeds, so it's already fun to do. But if you're, <laughs> if you're learning things along the way about the plant, you know, it's like we find a new compound or a new smell chemical. And then, you know, the next step is, well, how does this, how does this chemical breed, right? How is it inherited? So you cross that plant to a bunch of other plants and you self it and, the experimenting goes on, right? Every time we learn something, it's just the it just leads to more questions. So, and because cannabis has been ignored for call it a hundred years, you know, there's a lot of catch catch up to do. So it's a fun time, even though it's you know, even though the market and everything is crazy right now, it's still a good time to be playing with yeah. cannabis. True, and and you know, sometimes too, science and the markets are unchained from each other one one can progress without the you know solidity in the other but it, you know like you mentioned it is fun there there's a lot of um, new things we can apply to cannabis that we may have done with other crops other things in the past we're now applying it to cannabis so every day is almost a new day and for a curious brain who the hell doesn't freaking love that um so new stuff all the time and we've got trevor uh sun-grown mids up there i like to think of you as like our our resident uh, historian. Um, you're a man of many, many hats. So please introduce yourself. Thanks, Chad. Um, yeah, I'm Sun Grown Mids on Instagram, Trevor Whitkey in real life. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I, I hit up Peter and when I saw that he was doing a day on plant breeding and bringing in all the different people he was bringing in, um, to talk on the different subjects, the first person I thought of was Ryan. And the fact that a lot of these subjects kind of came to us, or at least the discussions were had with Ryan involved and being a, 
a kind of important voice on the, the online forums before we had terms for some of these things or knew what the hell we were talking about, Ryan was there to help inform us and kind of, he's somebody who, uh, he bridges both worlds. He's in the cannabis world and he's in the science world. And I feel like he, uh, he gets to call bullshit on both sides in a way that is really, you know, necessary. I think it's I'm necessary it. and constructive. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, it's helpful. So, uh, that's, that's why I felt having Ryan come on after this marathon and just kind of chop it up with him, see what he thought about some of the different subjects, some of the, like, you know, the past experiences with these discussions and sort of, you know, you've already mentioned uh, the Crawford brothers and the work they're doing. It, it's really cool to see people from that you saw in the forums back in the day actually leading and doing peer reviewed work or, you know, the stuff that you did, Ryan, with NAPRO back in, uh, in the medical days was groundbreaking. And so being able to talk about some of that history with you will be super, super awesome. Well, that's fun. Let's maybe dive into it there. I know we've had, uh, you know, a long day of panels. We've had some excellent topics. I'm going to have to go back and watch some of these because uh, I couldn't be in two places at one time today. Uh, but I did catch you earlier, Trevor, on, on a few panels. So maybe we can start there. Why don't you give us maybe a little bit of a recap? And then I'm pretty darn sure Ryan's ears are going to perk up at at least something you say here. And we'll we'll get the ball rolling from there. Cool. Yeah. So... There was dueling banjos on the two different FCPs today, so it was hard to catch everything. But and you know, starting starting at uh, 10 a.m. or what it, wherever it was on the East Coast, um, it was early here, so I missed the first um, factors influencing root formate. Or excuse me, that wasn't the first. Uh, the first presentation was Genetics, Tissue Culture, Clean Cannabis, and Cannabis Cultivation um, by Justin Esquivela, or Esquivel, excuse me, sorry for uh, mispronouncing your name. Uh, I missed that one. Um, I know that this topic, though, came up throughout the day. The Kind of the two big hitters throughout the day were that subject, tissue culture in particular, clean cannabis propagation, and hop latent viroid. I, I caught Zamir uh, Punja's presentation and uh, about the four different methods of the spread of hop latent viroid and the, the discussion that followed afterwards. Absolute must listen to. Check out the papers, anybody who hasn't already um, gone through them today, but those were really, really useful. We can dive into some of what uh, uh, Zamir and his group have found and just the general discussion there. Then more tissue culture, Connor Steven, and there was a really good discussion after his presentation on tissue culture and some of the advan uh, advances in the industry and applications. And again, it was one of those things where I was like immediately went back to conversations I've had with Ryan, where he's either introduced these ideas and been the first person that I've seen talking about some of this stuff, or been somebody who's talked about some of the pitfalls or limitations of tissue culture from experience back in the day. Um, Eleanor and I got to speak um, for a bit over an hour. That was great. Um, Eleanor uh, Kuntz is the head of LeafWorks uh, DNA, and she also works, uh, founded the Canador Herbarium. And so we got to talk about herbarium specimens, nomenclature, the importance of describing, naming, and creating type specimens so that we can actually have some stability to cultivar naming as opposed to this confusion and, you know, name game that goes on. Um, so yeah, tons of stuff. Polyploid breeding came up. So it was a full day of incredible discussions and we can, we can bounce in and out and discuss if you've got any questions about any of them, Ryan. Oh, I also uh, missed a very important one that happened early in the morning, which was Daniela uh, Vergara's paper um, where she talked about the different uh, cannabinoid, cannabinoid biosynthesis genes and 
uh, that was that was a good paper, very very good presentation, and it reminded me of some of your NAPRO work. And uh, we were talking about that before we went live. But um, it's interesting to see some of the work that's being done now, verifying and confirming findings that you had made, you know, almost 10 years ago at this point, eight to nine. Now, for, for somebody jumping in on the conversation, NAPRO work, what, what are we, oh, what sorry. is this? Yeah. Yes. NAPRO or NAPRO, however you want to call it, is a, a research company in California. Um, we did, re we did research on cultivation systems and, and, you know, production facilities, ran their lab work. Uh, we had an in-house independent lab, so we ran their lab work. And then we would oversee breeding programs for those companies. Um, essentially, we were doing the work, right, in their facilities. So, um, so yeah, because we had an independent lab, we just we had we had the ability to run lots and lots of samples of not only, you know, what was on the market. We we were running samples for buyers that were feeding the dispensary market, right? Um, so we got to really understand the, not only the cannabinoid content, but more importantly, the terpene and flavor molecules and how those are dispersed and what people are growing, because it's kind of, in a way, it's kind of conceptually similar to the types of wines people are drinking, right? So you're, you're actually going out on the market and getting a sample of what's out there. We also, because we had the grows, um, and we were doing breeding programs, we got to sample, like I said before we started, you know, uh, today the, the way lab sampling is done in most grow is a grower will grow out, say, 100 or 1,000 seeds, and you narrow that down to 10, 15 winter plants, and those winter plants get sent off to the laboratory, right? And so what you're actually getting is a chemical understanding of the plants that are suited for production, or at least that, that have graduated to the next level of screening, right? And what you're missing is everything else so you kind of like there might be chemically important plants in the garbage right in the stuff that doesn't get selected for production um that you know so it you you, you have a different learning curve if you're if you're going to the market and picking samples versus if you're taking every plant in a grow and like in a breeding population and sending it to the laboratory because one plant that might be undesirable morphologically or phenotypically in a production context might be special or unique in some chemical way, right? Be it like a scent chemical or a cannabinoid. So, you know, if you're driving too fast, you kind of miss things, right? You can't stop and pick them up. Right. So. Is, is, there, is there a, you know, a, a formula almost to the chemo vars that you see it's you know kind of I'm a, I'm a music guy a producer so i can almost paint by numbers when it comes to a pop song if i do this this and that i know it's going to be a hit is there a, a chemo var that fits that that you've seen in the market through these studies or is it more or less just taking everything in cataloging ca cataloging that instead of market it's a good question, and it's really the multi-million dollar question, isn't it? I think the truth of the matter is, is it's like mar it's marketing. It's not necessarily – I think that probably many a good chemovar or cultivar has gone by the wayside because it didn't have the, the right name, right? Mm -hmm. And you certainly we've seen varieties on the market that have a great name, and they just don't live up to the hype for whatever reason. Um, so, you know, yeah. I don't know if that's an answer to your question. It's kind of a non-answer. Yeah, that's a good one. I have I have a wonderful way of asking long-winded questions. So I thought you did great on that one. Because that is, that's the million dollar question, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. It really is. Um, it's funny, after having seen the market, you know, Trevor was talking about this grouping system that was presented earlier today. You know, and, and after kind of was like I was saying about the, the importance of a good data set, like if you're going out and collecting samples from the market, you're only ma make you're, you're already missing 90 percent of the picture of what cannabis can do. Right. And so unfortunately, like a lot of the research this has been done by these universities, like the only legal source that they could get was go down to the dispensary and get some blue dream. Right. Well, as we know, as growers, especially those that are like, you know, if you've lived or worked in California, you know that 
Blue Dream actually specifically references one or two plants, right? Depending on the part of the country or the, the state that you're in. Blue Dream was relatively widely distributed in California. So there was a good chance if you were buying Blue Dream from a dispensary that you're actually getting the right thing, right? But the farther you went away from that center in California, the name didn't stop being sold, but the less likelihood that you had those plants did did really dramatically drop the farther you went away. Right. And so if you're like a university prof and you need to go get blue dreams like weed for your genetic study, you end up down at the dispensary. You're at the mercy of like luck, you know, if you're actually getting what is blue dream. Right. You know, and, you know, everybody knows I harp on this strain cultivar variety, you know, nomenclature thing. But it's like it's because it's part of a larger discussion. Right. It's really the same discussion as genetics and what is a variety and what makes a cultivar and you know like trevor was talking about the the um the herbarium like the importance of having a properly collected and described individual that represents the type right and so right now like you have breeders that are like oh yeah i invented like whatever ice cream sandwich i'm just making that name up i don't know if it is a name but if it is we're not i'm not actually talking about that but somebody says i you know i, I made up ice cream sandwich well, what is ice cream sandwich? Are all the plants the same? Do they look even related? Or is it like, you know, I've bought I've bought seeds before and you grow 100 plants and there's 100 different individuals in that line, right? Like they're literally, they're, they don't make up a type. They're all over the place. Yet the breeder claims ownership of everything that came from anything with his name, right? It's like, that's not the way that the plant world works, right? Like, if you create a type, I don't know, we do there's it's I don't know, we do this thing in cannabis where it's like people say I'm a breeder, and it's like breeding is taking a type and reducing it to a seed line so that it's reproducible all the time. Like that's the art of breeding, right? Or or taking a bunch of traits that are found in disparate plants and assembling all those traits into one plant. Like that's breeding. Even if that plant doesn't have to be become bred to be stable or uniform right to be able to be produced from seeds who cares grow it from cuttings right and that's the way that we grow cannabis typically anyway we grow plants from cuttings so there is a whole need for breeders and you know in a way many of the people around the world are kind of doing this they're just screening lots of plants and finding the best new ones yeah right I yeah, we, we've we've kind of been, you know, pheno hunting for the masses. And that's why I think we've gotten a lot of great new flavor profiles and terpene profiles as well. But that is uh, a conversation I've had just because we all three buy the same pack of seeds from one breeder. We're not going to have the same plant in most cases. Yeah, well, that's nonsense. I mean, that shouldn't happen. <laughs> you know, as someone that sells seeds, I, I mean, I try to make it so that if you're buying a pack of seeds they're at least within a type right mm -hmm. and if they aren't like that then i'll let you say so you know i'll usually tell people so um we got to do better than we are doing right now in the seed world L listen there's 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 goods and bads of what's happened in, in seed breeding in the last 50 years we've done a lot of shuffling okay and through sh shuffling and 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 just tight tight screening new levels of cream do rise to the top but what the one thing that cannabis has not done and no cannabis breeders i would say have really done and it's only starting to be done now is develop resistances and true like true resistance to abiotic threats right Stre like mites uh you know fungi all that kind of stuff right molds and yeasts and powdery mildew um and that's all starting to happen but like you know they've been doing that for decades and decades in other crops right so although we've built these pretty fancy plants with special you know flavor profiles and high thc levels they're not what i would call bulletproof plants um and that's unfortunately something that's a little bit more difficult to ingress into these special plants so like you know we've kind of hit this like a high plateau but it is a plateau and the next to get to the next level is actually going to take some real work and some real science. Right. So is, is it going to take real science in the fact where we're going to be using gene markers, maybe adding and subtracting and manipulating them, or is it going to be a traditional 
grow the next generation out, make your selections, look at the markers, grow the next generation out yeah, to got- get to the end point. Yeah, to me, they're the same thing. I mean, we're not talking – there's two paths. There's CRISPR, and then there's plant breeding. Molecular markers and all that kind of stuff is just another way of looking at the plant. Like I wanted to say earlier, it, there there is quite likelihood that, you know, Daniela's work and our work are going to replicate each other because what we're looking at is is what's reality under the, under the mess, right? She looks at it through a genomic lens. We look at it through a chemical lens. But the 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 gene the 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 metabolome, which is really the collection of all the metabolites that the plant produces, is a reflection of the genome, right? Which is all the genes that the plant possesses, right? And so, you know, even when they were talking about like the prenylated, you know, sulfur compounds, these these thiol compounds that have the skunky scent, gar- skunky garlicky scents, right? Those are a result of some genetic action in the plant right that results in these plants you can you can look at that through for looking at the genes that do those kinds of actions or you can just look at the chemistry they're kind of like two different lenses looking at the same problem right so you know i think that they have to go hand in hand for a beginning but at a certain point in time you can say you know once you learn that hey this gene is responsible for this chemical effect that we see in the plant if it's cheaper to look for the gene then hey you look for the genetic marker right um okay. so it's just yeah and and it's still going to require traditional breeding on the level of distributing even once you find if you use genomic markers to identify and locate a trait specific or associated gene and you still have to integrate it into your target plant population and so all that still numbers population and that's where i think like yeah the science level of it like you can have a lot of machines you can have a lot of assays you can do a lot of higher level science but really that's typically funded through universities that's why most of the present presenters are you know from universities presenting mm-hmm. their findings um but in like the commercial setting it's just going to be going through lots and lots and lots of plants and using those tools to the extent that they further the goals and are economically feasible well and that's the po- that's the hard thing right i mean <laughs> there's a reason that these that these growers that are looking for production plants they only send 20 of the plants of the thousand plants that they grew to the lab right because you know, each one of those things comes with like a two to four hundred dollar bill, depending on how many chemicals you're looking for, right? So if you don't have the laboratory in house, if you do have the laboratory in house, maybe thirty forty dollars a test. If you don't have the laboratories, you know, in house, you're looking at four hundred dollars a test. So it it's like it kind of becomes a specific model, right? Unfortunately, like you have to have an investor that understands, hey, I'm going to put some money into R and D and it's going to pay off in the long run. Right. And right now, the truth is, as well, the market ain't sold by chemistry. The market is sold by yo, yo, yo. It's ice cream cookies or whatever the fuck the name is of the day. Right. Excuse my language. So it's like, you know, the market needs to shake out a bit and mature a bit. I think we need to have it's like, I don't know. It's like it's like we just legalized still in a way and we're still getting the yayas out of our system <laughs> well, yeah. in, in a sense. But I mean, to, to kind of tie it back, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but we've kind of identified some um, genes that are PM resistance or can help with that. So are we at a point where only the universities are then testing the offspring to say, oh, it carried over 40 percent in this one? only 10% in this one, well, we want to work with this. Or is that happening commercially as well? Is it cost prohibitive to speed up that that breeding or selection of these resistances? So it, it, it's like, okay, look, somebody showed that in, in a, like, for example, the powdery mildew one, that's like a grow in the east coast of Canada that was a university professor at a university of New Brunswick, I believe it was. Um, they found a plant or a, a, a resistance gene in one of their lines so now that like gene info is published in a database if you want to figure out if you have it in any of your line i mean the first thing you'd have to do is say you either if you're going to start a breeding project with that line or with with that trait 
you either need to contact them and say, hey, yo, can I get the plant with that gene? Or you start bioprospecting your own populations looking for that genetic marker or that, you know, that gene, right? That genetic sequence. And hopefully that in your own test, you know, hey, I found this genetic sequence, self the plant, you make it homozygous and you notice, holy shit, this plant does seem to be quite resistant to powder, resistant to powder mildew. You know, then it's good. You have just multiple pieces of info that say, hey, yeah, you've got that gene in your library. And then you start the long, arduous process of making F1s with everything that you want to introduce it to and start going through the process of, you know, shuffling in different ways to try to get that one piece of the gene from wow. that one genome while one ignoring gene. everything else. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it still sounds cost prohibitive, but if you have that intuition God, and that one in the corner that, you know, everything else gets PM, but this one never gets it, that might be the one to uh, send off and spend your money on. You're going to do anything you can to try to, you know, to try to narrow down the search. Yeah, for, for sure. Because as you're seeing, it's like at any time you want to start trying to answer these questions with science, it's like the bills start, <laughs> they start catching up, you know, you, and you only have so much money to spend. Like any investor is only going to say, hey, go and spend this much money, <laughs> right? Because if you're not, if you're not turning the results from those research dollars, then the money dries up pretty quick. Yeah. The ROI, man, return on investment, you, you know, research is great, but until it, you know, can be deposited. A lot of investors don't care too much. Yeah. You know, yeah. Now, Trevor, you were talking about earlier, there were some, some grant programs uh, that have recently come available. Yeah. So something very specific in um, California. It's interesting. It's, um, it's a genetic research program that's being funded and it's Humboldt's just gone through a transition, uh, excuse me, Humboldt, uh, like, <laughs> yes, through cannabis world, but the university in Humboldt was a Cal State University for years. It's just now switched to a Cal Poly. There's a bunch of investment going into turning Humboldt into a leading environmental institution. And a professor there um, is spearheading a project that is looking, I believe, at genetics more through a sociological context to a certain extent and is trying to connect the genetics and the people that are growing them and do a research study on existing heirloom cannabis in Northern California. Yeah, there was a grant that was given to, it was put out to people, but you had to be within the university system in the state. And only the universities or researchers at those universities could apply. So, like, for example, somebody in private industry couldn't apply and say, mm -hmm. you know, I want access to some of that cash, <laughs> right? Yeah, so, which is too nice. bad. But um, because, I mean, what's the limited? Uh, I mean, it sounds like interesting enough, but like, how is that going <laughs> to, like, what is that going to do? Yeah, no, I feel like it's kind of more of a history and documentation program is what's going to arise out of it. More these of like are a the herbarium got, thing. Yeah, these are the people that got screwed in legalization. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. Oh, man, yeah. I, I, I saw that earlier and I just made the comment of the guy who invented Tetris never got paid for it. We'll probably have a lot of Tetris makers in this industry. So what, what, what do you think could be one of the more positive results? from the, this grant money or this, this type of work? What, what would be a good outcome or something you would hope to see? That organizations that are doing good work get funded out of it and are able to use that funding to actually do, like, I think the herbarium is really important work. And I think um, Ryan's kind of sent me on a, full tangent um, over the full last couple of years on the whole strain cultivar uh, divide and debate. And it's interesting when you really go in, read the ICNCP, read all the different editions of it, follow the, the sort of um, nomenclatural debates that have gone on for the last, you know, hundred years plus. And it's 
kind of frustrating because all of this has already been solved and addressed and is just like it's common standard operating practices in every other agricultural commodity, every other horticultural commodity, every other crop and plant just exist in this system. And there's so much confusion and misinformation and misunderstanding about cultivar names and the importance of cultivar names and establishing them and not just making superfluous names and also not ignoring names that already exist and are assigned. Because we can't just wipe the slate clean and be like everything that happened prior to legalization isn't a thing and we're just going to ignore it despite the fact that it actually meets all of the requirements for cultivar recognition. Most, some of them do. The described ones do. Exactly. Least. Yeah, yeah. The, the published described ones. And the, the work that they're doing with the herbarium, tying it into that, is doing that work. It's creating a type specimen, a description, and assigning it in a herbarium that's preserving all of these with, you know, there's a description and there's genomic information, chemical information. So, and they're right. really, really beautiful uh, pressings too. Like I've seen some herbarium specimens that are just like- Vegetative terrible. or flower as well? Uh, I, th I think they've done flower. I, I do believe they've done flower. I know it's primarily vegetate, uh, vegetative, but um, I've seen the process when they're doing it and I've seen them out there cutting on some some flowering plants. They must have. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Huh. Yeah, but uh, it's that work is worthwhile and is something it seems like the most tangible um, outcome of this project and this grant money is going and expanding the herbarium and kind of making it hopefully more accessible and useful for people. Yeah, I had a thought the other day that like, you know, all this like, Ethan called them, it, it, he said at one point in time, you know, the difference is, are you a lumper or a splitter, right? It's like, are you trying to group <laughs> things or find the differences between things? And, you know, I think one of the best, I always give this analogy that people to, for people to think about cannabis as, you know, a lot of people, they only touch the cultivars, they don't see the populations being grown. Right, but when you start looking at all the, the populations that are actually grown, it's like the variation that we see in cannabis is kind of like the variation we see in humanity, right? And everything from like hair color, skin color to like eye color and height and you know width and everything, like shoe size, right? Like literally every trait that we have as a human varies and cannabis is really much the same as that, right? So. You know, I think that like at a certain point in time, the discussion about what's what becomes academic. It's interesting to know from like a historical perspective, you know, where the pieces came from. But it all breeds together, right? Hemp breeds to drug cannabis, breeds to these auto flowering, call them progenitors of, or not progenitors, descendants of ruderalis, right? Um, where do you draw the lines? And is it important to, right? And when we start trying to draw those lines in like humanity, it brings up some pretty uncomfortable realities, right? Like talk of race and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know. To, to me, it's like at a certain point in time, it's like, you know, when Trevor, you were saying, it's like, oh, they've got these data clouds, right? It's like those data clouds, they're, they're separate right now because there's not enough individuals on there. As you start putting more and more plots on those graphs, those those clouds become nebulas that kind of grow into each other, right? Because really everything is just hybrids of hybrids of hybrids at this point in time. Like how different can it be? And they all came from, I, I think we could probably safely say that everything came from the same ancestors at this point in time. Right. Yeah. On that, I, I definitely feel like that's one reason people just need to stop worrying about and, focusing on the botanical sort of debate in terms of the species question, indica, sativa, ruderalis, and all of the confusion created by essentially a 1970s court issue. Um, <laughs> yeah. And like, just leave all of that behind 
and we don't need to like unless you're Ernest Small or a taxonomist who wants to be it really, isn't really yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not. And what is important is uh, the cultivated code. The botanical code doesn't shouldn't really matter to us. And if you've read it, it's it's even more mind numbing than the cultivated code. But the ICNCP is where all of the action should be because we're dealing with cultivated plants. We're either dealing with something that falls into a category that already exists or hasn't been characterized exactly. and doesn't exist. Well, and they're, what, they're cultivated for a purpose too, right? They're cultivated for commerce, right? Like that's an important thing to understand when you're choosing which code you're going to look at right and that's kind of what the that's what upov does right the problem there there's problem with upov is there's problems with upov as well but you know like we've been talking about trevor i mean it's a it's a long la language evolves right and use of language evolves right like the words that, you, that we see being used by kids today it's not what we used when we were growing up and you know obviously our parents said the same thing right like so the use of language evolves and maybe we even get better at using language which i think is true in the you know as we try to put in rules for systems like regulating you know varieties there's a reason why we're trying to regulate varieties right like i had a variety called frostbite and somebody came along and named one called purple frostbite it wasn't even related to it right so it's like you know it, it just there's and not you know not in, in that world, it was who came first, right? Like who squatted on the name first. But in in the modern day, when you are granted, when you, you put in an application for a cultivar variety, when when the the licensing authority says, okay, you're granted that authority, part of that is is we accept your name for this variety, right? And you get to have that the legal use of that name. Like that's that's part of the licensing trade, right? The licensing give and take. So that you now have that, that's now a legal thing. That name is now a legal thing that you can protect that nobody else can use, right? And so these things save, they save, they, they stop confusion in the marketplace, right? And they stop fraud in the marketplace. Like, let's be honest, somebody's selling Blue Dream that's not Blue Dream in like a, a dispensary in Massachusetts, that's fraud right like there's laws in the united states that stop like people from bringing in like fraudulent products from china and selling them under your brand name right and so there are reasons to that we should that we should go ahead with these systems right and i think that that's one of the things you know maybe that we're talking about one of the good things that comes from legalization is that people can take plants that they have bred and especially you guys in the united states you can get something called a plant patent right um which is what like um what are they what's the plant lavender like if you're a lavender grower or breeder and you find a new plant you can take a cutting and send it to a lab and get a description of the oil and show how just you describe the plant and show how it's different from everything else and you can get a certificate or a licensing rights essentially from uh i think it's the uspto or the usda that essentially gives you the rights to market and you know commercially license that variety to growers and stuff well, right? let's let, let's hit that real quick because it's it, you know a plant pant, patent so you said it's going to have to be the chemovar it can't and it has to be no reproducible or no how, what how is it uniquely itself and the propagation from what I understood, it had to be a clone, but it has to represent the same each and every time to get a patent on it. Or no, can there be variation? There's there's always a range. So there's like a, a yeah. described range, but it's not also necessarily about chemistry. In the case of that lavender plant, if the, if the chemical composition of the essential oil is the defining characteristic of that variety, then it's all about the chemical composition. But it might be... Hey, I found this new plant. Like, for example, you know, the freak show plant with the weird web web leaves. You he he could theoretically could have, he can't now, but back then, before it had been released, he could have gone to the USPTO and say, I found a new type of cannabis. It's got this weird leaf mutation. 
I want a plant pat plant patent on it. And he would have been granted based on morphology because it, it it's it's all about novelty or uniqueness. Is the thing that you've developed new in the context of everything else that exists, right? Which so again, like I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to what Trevor was saying. This again underlies the importance of describing cultivars because in order to show that something is novel, you have to have a reference set to compare it against, right? And so that's one of these interesting things about cannabis is like, how do you show that something is novel, right? What's the reference set? Um, you know, so that, you know, these are all like kind of areas that need to be kind of worked out for cannabis because we're, we're crossing new horizons as we go to do these things. Right. And there's like a set of characteristics and traits that define and differentiate hemp cultivars and that's been upov and other bodies have worked yeah, on that UPOV, they haven't done it for drugs as much absolutely not for drugs because they don't consider so the interesting thing about upov and the upov system it was all developed kind of out of the you know you've everybody's heard the dutch tulip craze story right you came up with a new tulip you were you were a millionaire or whatever but all of the traits that are important to tulips are they have to do with leaf shape and color right and so the system of registration of plants developed out of morphology, not chemistry. Like, so for example, even today, I can't, it, you can't take a new rose through the breeder's right system at UPOV and say, this ro rose is, it's also a red rose, but it's different based on its scent. That won't pass, right? Because the system is so based on morphology. You can su you can add genomic and chemical analysis as a supplementary like piece of documentation with your app application, but the application is based on morphology. So as Trevor said for hemp, like if you're trying to get like a, a hemp variety registered through UPOV, there's a checklist that you go through and you have to decide. You know, you say like, how big are the petioles? Uh, how what's the color of the seed? How big are the seeds? What's the width? what's the width of the stem and the leaf length, all this kind of stuff, right? And it's part of what what that is, is you're describing the physical characteristics. Again, we're saying that word, like this is part of describing a, a type to show that your type is different from other types. But the, like all those traits that we just mentioned are completely useless for drug cannabis, right? Like they're literally irrelevant, right? The, the, the width of the stem or all that. Well, they're not irrelevant. I mean, sure, they they... They play roles in agronomic traits, but that's not what defines one strain of cannabis from another, right? Like from of one type of cannabis from another, which is all about like the flower shape and flavor and chemistry and you know, everything that's in the flower. So um, yeah, it's an interesting. It's an interesting time, right? As we try to fit this these systems into cannabis, because cannabis has to merge with these systems. It has to happen. There's no other way except uh, if we're going to be doing commerce globally with cannabis, cannabis needs to fall into these systems. It's just the way it is. So yeah, it's going to be an interesting thing watching, you know, it's like the, like doing the weave on merging lanes on a highway. It's going to be an interesting weave and I'm sure that we'll see a few accidents. <laughs> People freak it out, you know, a couple of tow trucks. Yeah. And I mean, some of that stuff's happening right now and is a w interesting corollary to some of the random research I've been doing um, over the last couple of days where the U.S. pharmacopoeia in 1851 added cannabis, but it was really specific that the drug cannabis that could be used in the United States pharmacopoeia from 1851 till the early 1900s, like 19. Teens. I'm not sure the exact date. Um, it was the ninth edition when they changed it. Um, it always had to come from India specifically. It was Indian grown drug cannabis was permissible as in the US pharmacopoeia in the like from the 19 teens to the 1930s, they allowed for cannabis Americana, cannabis grown in America. And it was because a bunch of pharmaceutical companies like Eli Lilly and Park Davis wanted to, yeah, they, they lobbied for it and wanted to get the change to uh, allow for American. 
and the studies that they did were absolute bullshit. They're just ridiculous. Um, the they didn't know what THC was. They didn't know what the like actual active contents were. Oh, and so ninety years before they even knew what CBD was, right? So, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. They they knew very almost nothing, and um, they just got dogs really high. And if it got the dog high, then <laughs> it worked. And that was how they tested it. It was like either a hundred percent of Indian grown cannabis um, equivalent and how high it got the dog or like, you know, 40 to 90%. Anyway, that's being updated right now. The FDA and the US Pharmacopeia, there was an update and it was re-added a few years ago, but they're doing a more extensive update right now. And that's gonna have all kinds of implications for medicinal and food, uh, applications of cannabis going forward in whatever sort of regulatory world that emerges and so yeah lots of potential accidents on the the future cannabis highways 175 years ago and we're still doing the same work more or less <laughs> yeah 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 and, and just like re like initiating the same process and um so yeah that's uh that's something that I feel like, you know, is happening right now. And we're, there's so much of it that needs to happen. And there's kind of, you mentioned the lumpers and the splitters and sort of the taxonomic world in the cultivar, uh, the cultivated plants nomenclature world. It's almost like there's two camps. There's the, let's wipe the slate clean and blank and just pretend everything prior to this date isn't here or let's try and go back and look at what's account for what's already been done and what exists and what names are taken, get rid of all of the superfluous names that aren't needed and then move forward where we can say chem D is chem D chem 91 is chem 91 OG is OG and all of the synonym OGs that emerged are just synonym OGs. Yeah. So it's OG, it's not Tahoe OG, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's... Every one of them gets grouped and merged, and we have a cultivar list, a checklist, because for every other cultivated plant, there's a checklist and a register, not everyone, but for most economically important uh, crops or plants, there's a cultivar checklist and there's a register, uh, registry authority. And for us, there isn't one, but we can still do that work. And the only people so far who have done it is Wim Snjord, I think his name is. And his checklist is total nonsense, too, if you oh, actually wow. read through it. Like, yeah. wow. who, who stands to benefit financially from that, though? Just because we figured out what the real OG is, who, who cares? Well, On yeah, a financial level. Uh, so that's these things like to a certain extent don't necessarily intersect with a financial um, like there's a the reason is is that there's a name the name's been taken and we need to stop confusion surrounding names independent of whether or not there's a financial incentive for a particular commercial entity in doing that there is and for some, and there's like, if you look at a lot of, you know, the the existing names that are just cannot be refuted that are recognized by the ICNCP as a result of the fact that they've been registered in some sort of uh, registration authority that's legislatively like the UPOV or the US patent system. Those are all recognized by the ICNCP and our existing cultivars. And there's just no real debate about it because their names have been registered in a, uh, a, a, I think they refer to them as legislative authorities because they're created by legislatures of different nations. But anyways, all of those names get included, but then there's all these other random names that have been used and have been ascribed a description that actually exists in like nursery catalogs and real things and can be referred to and according to the rules at least of the ICNCPR qualify as cultivars just nobody's done the work 
to actually go through and say this qualifies, that doesn't. Here's the problem with that. A lot of the stuff that's been written in, in catalogs and descriptions are, are for seed populations. Those seed populations don't actually match the descriptions. Exactly. So those don't right. qualify. So, well, yeah, they're, but they're, that's... they're nonsense, right? So at this point in time, like I, I think that we'd have to limit it to like some, you know, we're, there's this ongoing discussion about varieties being brought into this into the legal system in California and who's going to benefit from them and who developed who developed them and you know can they use the names and you know the people trying to enter those varieties into the system didn't breed them right but any it's like do you think the person people that bred those plants have any idea of like the type of breeding that was being done back then was not good enough to be like hey all these plants match this description right and really none of the breeding that's being done today like very little of the breeding that's being done today is like hey you're going to grow these plants and they're all going to be like type 3 limonene dominant right like that level of of uniformity in breeding just call it from the like the home famous breeders in the world like that stuff you're not finding that you just don't get that's not what you get what you're buying is a name from a guy it's kind of like buying a banksy painting maybe would be more of a description like i'm not saying that it has the same value as a banksy painting either let me make that clear but it's like you're buying into the, you're buying into the hype rather than buying a described something right and uh, totally and they're like the dust test and uh, distinct uniform stable like the stability aspect from seed as you know the the 10 pack uh, analogy but that doesn't mean that they can't be a cultivar exactly right? Yeah, exactly. And in a clone only characterization and like we the thing is, is we've got a lot of these plants that are heirloom elite clone only. And one of the value of the NAPRO work that you guys did was you characterized a lot of stuff chemically at a time and a place where I feel infinitely more confident in the NAPRO's chemical analysis that comes on the assigned names than I do for like whatever that uh, chem dog uh, and the purple kush sort of like genome scaffolding that have uh, been done by different genomics people because like the source for that chem dog I believe was greenhouse seeds or something if you look in the oh, it actual wasn't even, it was a dispensary the, the chem dog clone I, you could definitely debate I don't know if they've since done a, an updated with markers to see if it actually matches the clone how that was kevin mckernan he went into a he went into a coffee shop in amsterdam bought some something labeled chem dog brought it to the guys from dna genetics because their name is dna genetics they must know about dna forget the fact that their names are don and aaron right but anyway so he goes to them because they're the experts and they looked at the bud and said yeah it's chem dog so that's like your value, <laughs> right? i mean it's not really what we call high validation the purple kush that page did actually is Canadian, what was being grown in Canada as purple kush, different plant from what's grown in California as purple kush, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, a, a super gassy plant, but you know, I don't know. I it's, I think maybe we differ in our value in both plants, Trevor. Like, sour GOG. Listen, one of the things that the Napro work taught me was that those plants, as themselves, as individuals, especially as I began breeding them all. Those plants were, um, I would call those like uh, cultivar archetypes, and those plants would be the archetype. But like, like you said, you know, the OGs and everything that descended from it. Like, there's two things that happened with the OGs. OG, the original whatever, you know, that super gassy plant, it was hybridized with a bunch of stuff, and two things happened: a bunch of plants descended from that line that smelled that retained that gassy smell and a bunch of different plants descended from that line that retained the og part of the name right and so what you had is the second generation of you know such and such og that smells nothing like og did in the first place right which to me is that should be an unacceptable part of the system right like mm -hmm. OG should because that's what OG was is it specified is what we called the gold class in at, under the NAPRO classification system right 
and and so we had gold class you know obviously gold class silver class purple class we had all these we it was like a color class system but you know for example OG is in the gold class. Cookies was in the black class. Sour Diesel was in the white class, right? Legend OG was in the silver class. But that way, as we would find new plants that ha that retain that scent, but they might be different, like morphological or in other ways, they still fit into that like flavor profile, right? And then, so it was. I don't know if it'd be the best way to use for. It, it almost is the best way for varieties in a way, because again when you're going out and you're buying wine you you know they they sort them by type right like you buy them you buy they group all the pinots together they group all the you know the bubblies together they group all the the chablis together you know and i think that that's a good way especially for the probably large majority of cannabis buyers that aren't the everyday consumers you know for them especially, it would be a really helpful way for them to be able to navigate cannabis if you went in and they understood that, like, you know, here's the different types that you can buy. Oh, you want fruity stuff or you want kind of gassy stuff or you want the cookies, dessert kind of stuff. And it's, you know, it should, I think, this is what we proposed to, you know, the guys from SC Labs, like, way back we were doing this work in 2015. Is You know, I said, like, this is the way that dogs are judged right like when you have the dog show all the german shepherds compete against each other and then all the shih tzus compete against each other and all the labs compete against against each other and then at the end there's a best in show right which is kind of what like a cannabis cup is it's like best in show but it would be really cool if all the different types competed against each other first right before the top choices in each category you know competed for best in show so I think that's where they're going with the way that they've started grouping them. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people have started, uh, and by people I mean different events, um, have started to work on that kind of either do, you know, themed events where it's the same people behind different themed events, but it's like we're going to do the dessert class, we're going to do the sour class, the OG, the uh, the haze, et cetera. Yeah. And I think that that definitely, um, and that's that's where this work is valuable, is characterizing and characterizing it better than it was characterized in the past. Like I have the old catalogs and you're right. And so far as from, from seed, a lot of those, you know, Northern Lights, I saw somebody ask, is that a cultivar? I mean, Northern Lights, it it's a name that's been ascribed it's been published and it's and there's a description attached to it if you read the description it's not useful so i'm not sure how a registration authority would deal with that um the population and the seeds weren't stabilized so it's one of those things where it's probably in seed form doesn't qualify as a cultivar almost but not, it, uh, almost nothing called qualifies in seed form in cannabis yeah, totally. Yeah, cannabis is going to be very difficult to get uniform, stable, and distinct cultivars. It takes, it takes breeding. It takes breeding to do it, but that level of breeding hasn't gone into it. And again, it is like it's it's an obligate outcrosser that has been subject to rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds of hybridization for the last 50 years. I mean, it's going to be hyper variable at this point in time, but you can sort it out, right? And we've definitely made varieties that would that would that could be registered as, as chemical varieties, right? Because the chemistry is true, mm -hmm. right? You go and proceed, at yeah. least they're true in the first generation, so. Yeah, and if that's reproducible, and I mean, even if it's, you know, only a single seed lot, it's still, um, yeah, it still qualifies. And I just think that that's something that, um, that's where the focus, energy, and work should be done, not Indica Sativa discussions you know like that's so old and tired and not helping anybody but there is so much work to be done in really formalizing what's what's existing and valuable you know because we've got some some valuable things that exist in the clone only space but they're not they're not recognized in any 
uh, formal sense. You know, just kind of touching maybe on what you guys are hitting at here, because again, this doesn't really relate indica or sativa. That was kind of the point that they were trying to get away from with this study. Uh, but basically, this revealed like distinct clusters of common co-occurring terpenes as like an effective way of labeling versus traditional indica sativa hybrid. But if you could go into your dispensary and shop, like Ryan was suggesting, buy this profile, I think that would be a lot more effective. But is this is that really the best way to separate things out? Or how would we how would we work that in terminology that we're able to educate people on? Because again, we're trying to bridge that gap here. I, I mean, I think that that's a great way to do it. That's why we developed the Phytofax. It's actually, you know, the Phytofax, which is actually used by the Emerald Cup and SD Labs is using it now. That's why we developed Phytofax, right? That was a, one of the NAPRO products that we developed. Um, and it was for that reason specifically. Like, how do you convey the chemistry to the, to the consumer? Um, I think it's great. You have to learn how to read it. Like it does take you a little bit of time to learn, hey, these are the colors and this is what they mean. We tried to make them um, self-evident, like, you know, limonene is yellow, lemons are yellow. Um, beta caryophylline is black, osamine is orange, right? So the, the uh, lavender linalool is, is yellow, right? So there you can, there's, you can see this is a linalool beta caryophylline uh, limonene, and I can tell that just because of the three lines right at the top of the chart, right? Yellow, purple, and blue. Um, which is, you know, e even for the people that aren't looking at the chemistry, if they go in every time and they buy one, because you might have a different variety that's red, you know, red, blue, and green, for example, right? Or red, blue, and yellow or something. Eventually, over time, people get to know, oh, I like the ones that had this color profile in them. So you're, we're subtly feeding people information, even if they don't really want to look at it, right? Um, sorry, Chad, I, I was just sending you a, a copy of like another thing of the work. So I'll just send it. Okay. That. Awesome. I will look for that here in the uh, private chat. There we go. Let me bring this up for you guys. Yeah, I've just kind of pulled that up um, on the whim here. You know, this I was referencing the study, the phyto chemical diversity the other day and something I was working on. Um, so that's why that rang a bell, but Phytofax was just pulling that up. Let's see here. Okay. Yeah, so I care about my SC brand. lab started using it and now they put it on their lab report. So it's kind of nice in California that at least a larger segment of people are becoming used to this one lab report because it really is quite informative if you, if you learn um, how to read it. Um, and you know, like I, we were talking about the colors, like the pineys, pinenes, for example, are green. Right. And so we tried to build it intuitively because just by looking at a picture, you know, every time you look at a graph and it's like all the bars on the graph are black and you have to reference back, what is this bar? Oh, it's pinene. You know, it takes you time to try to f build the profile in your brain. But by making it into a graph that's colored, it's now an image, right, that you can interpret in a second. You can say, oh, look, the yellow line is the highest or the orange line is the highest, right? Or there's no black line or whatever. Um, but yeah, so that one is, uh, limonene, beta caryophylline and linalool with, with two kind of pinene kickers, I call them. Right. And it, it, it becomes like a pretty easy way to just look at a variety. And when, when we, when we quick assessment, when we ran a bunch of stuff, you end up with like, it's like having a stack of card deck of cards. That's all unshuffled, right? You flip them over so you can see the faces and you can start, Oh, look, these, you can start putting all the clubs together and put all the diamonds together it was literally no different doing that with the lab types right because you have we had like two three hundred lab results from different cultivars and as you you start building a thing you're like oh look all these ones are kind of the same all these ones are kind of the same and uh we kind of you know we kind of just let the data speak for itself in a way right like these these classes or groups kind of revealed themselves out of the data right how you know we were talking earlier too you know i i love my flower you enjoy concentrates how does this conversation apply to concentrates is it verbatim over to that because it seems like there's a little bit more 
depends on uh, custom custom ability customizing yeah well it, and it uh, i was going to say it a different way i mean what you call customizability i would say is the is the skill of the extractor right like some extractors really know their art and they're going to preserve every compound it, it's why i find this t this term you you hear thrown around all the time in our industry full spectrum well what's full spectrum right i mean okay maybe broad spectrum or a wider spectrum but like a full spectrum should literally it should the chemical analysis of the flower at least in profile it might not match in concentration but the profile of the extract should match the flower right and i and i think certain processes or temperatures or pressures who knows all of those things can affect which of the volatiles end up in the extract or which of the volatiles end up in the extract right maybe some favoring certain compounds over others um so so we would need to define the classification for the flower and exactly its constituents and what is a representative of it and then that would be how we would judge the concentrates based off of that criteria maybe to, yes, to, to say no, it's a no, blue dream concentrate no yeah i don't think you have to because it's like it, it it becomes like wine, right? Like so, you got. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna get it wrong on what the grapes are, but like for example, you have specific grape varieties, right? But the wines that are made from those varieties, like a Beaujolais, for example, is a French wine that's a blend, right? It's not it's not what you would call a varietal wine, right? It's not a it's not a varietal wine of that variety, right? And so we'll end up with varietal hashes will end up with blended hashes right or extracts someone will take two very unique cultivars that have different flavor profiles and co-extract them perhaps right so i think that uh you, you wouldn't want to put those types of handcuffs on on the market right or on what the extractors are going to do because i think that there will probably be some really beauty beautiful things that come from co-extraction it might be, for example, that you like certain terpene profiles, you can't have two things in the same plant. Like, I, I don't know if it's impossible, but we had a very hard time through hybridization making plants that were high in, like, usually, for example, if I had a plant that was high in myrcene and then a plant that was high in pinene, I could cross those two things together and a subset of the plants would have both. But I couldn't force terpenaline and limonene together right and so i don't know if those were on I, I don't know why you couldn't find that combination of things but maybe you can but I, we couldn't do it through hybridization right so you might want to have an extract that's high in both terpenaline and limonene and the only way to get that is to co-extract terpenaline flowers with limonene flowers right because you can't make the hybrid so Many more possibilities than we can even imagine is well, what that sounds like. It's kind of the beauty of cannabis, right? And it's it's one of the beautiful things that it's like, you know, it's like the, the grower and breeder side, the production side, and then the producer extractor side, like, you know, you can have one plus one equals three, right? Like something that neither side can do, those two, those two groups together can produce something that's totally new. And that's kind of a cool thing for an industry, right? To be able to to have that, like, what's done on the farm and then what's done in, call it the lab or the kitchen, right? To bring it to the consumer. Well, there's, there's another, you know, distinction, too, that quite possibly comes into play. It seems like seed seeds for the commercial market, you know, sold in bulk, that needs to have the common expression same morphology, same height, same all that. We don't see a lot of that in the home or hobby level markets. So what really- In cannabis. In cannabis, yes. Because <laughs> I mean, in like a lot of other things in the like home and hobby level, you you will get more stability, but go on, sorry. Sure. Well, I would sure. say that that's true for, for selfers like tomatoes, but how many home, like how many heirloom um, wheat varieties do you know of, right? Like. It's almost like those types of outcrossing crops are done by corporations because the scale that's required to really breed them is larger than, you know, any, a family can maintain a tomato line in your greenhouse, 
a little more difficult yeah. to maintain wheat over generations. Yeah, yeah, and like I mean, I know in our area there's a particular like there's a pepper that's bred and maintained by a family in Vallecito near us, and like they're doing that, but that's not it's not on the scale, and there's uniformity and stability in that. Um, uh, but yeah, again, a selfer, mm -hmm. right? Selfing, selfing species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna segregate all crazy all in the. I think the, part of the answer is that, I mean, we can blame the breeders. We can also blame the prohibitionists, right? Like, why aren't these plants pro propagated clonally? They don't need to be bred if Farmer Joe can sell to customer X and Y, right? And the only reason that Farmer Joe is selling them seeds is because he's not legally allowed to sell them clones and ship them clones, right? And because that whole system of shipping clones is legal... We don't have a system through which, like the lab system, like for tissue culture, through which to put our clones to make sure that we're shipping them clean, yeah. clean, right? So it's like the whole, all the problems spiral are really a result of the way the industry works, you know? And it's really like we've gone from prohibition to regulations and they're like both of them are just completely <laughs> fucked. Well, and the regulations are all about restricting the escape of the drug into the children's hands, not about, hey, how do we build an industry that is work that works and is safe and is, you know, has things like, you know, plant phytosanitary protection, right? Like all basic stuff. Like, you know, I used to live in this valley up north of Whistler in British Columbia called Pemberton, and it's a potato. Um, they make the potato seeds that go, get sold down to Idaho, right? And so you drive in, there's a big sign on the side of the road that says, no, 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 you can't plant tomato, potato varieties. Like you can't, you're not allowed to just bring up potato and plant them into the ground. They have to go through the lab, right? To make sure that they're clean. And that's just the rule. It's an agricultural rule. You're breaking the law if you violate it, right? And we don't have any of those systems in cannabis because they're too busy thinking about the children, right? Not thinking about the industry. I was listening to an interview uh, the other day with a, a gentleman called Heavy Days, and uh, he's in Australia. And they were talking about clones, and and the situation came up, and he's like, "Don't take them. I don't want to be the guy who brings, you know, HPLVD to Australia." And that, you know, it rang a bell. And we just came back from the Netherlands. We were able to actually bring tulip bulbs back with us this time because we did have the phytosanitary certificate. Oh, nice. Good. Good. But, uh, you know, that's, that's a real thing. I don't know how far it has spread, but hearing a lot of the talks today, the frequency of which it's occurring in seeds, that's got me scared because I haven't taken a clone in over a decade well, for, for a variety of reasons. But seeds I have taken. Oh, we know for since two years ago, 100%, oh. it's already in Australia. Somebody brought in oh, legal, legal seeds and it, it ended up over there on legal seeds. So for wow. sure, it's it's there already. I think if it's anywhere growing cannabis, it's there. Right. Um, well, if, if he's listening, then open game, buddy. Get those clones. <laughs> <laughs> Not here's, on you. <laughs> here's just one of the things that I was going to say earlier. I mean... When, when uh, Trevor's talking about these legacy clones, I know that they're seen as such value in the industry. Truthfully, once you get these plants and you start hybridizing them to each other and growing a bunch of the offspring and looking for the for in the offspring with a lab, trust me, you find better plants than chem dog and cookies. Okay, so like, you know, I at, at a certain point in time, I went to my library and I killed the whole thing. Because it's it's kind of like, have you ever heard of like Cortez, you know, when Cortez came to the New World and he like burned all the ships? He's like, when you burn all the ships, it's like, then you really, all the workers really have to start thinking about making a life and living where they are, right? And keeping those clones was just letting me fall back and make more of seeds from those same clones for the market. That's not what a plant breeder does. Right, plant breeders move lines forward. So, you may have to grow s some plants that are not as good, but the idea is that you find other plants that are better, right? And you use those to move things forward. And a lot of the industry in California, I'm afraid to say, is that these breeder guys are still everybody's. It's like, oh, I've got the Chem 91 or the Chem 4, or the Sour Diesel, and it's like, 
we need to stop making more seeds of all the same plants because we're just standing still genetically, right? We're not getting anywhere. Um, so I think it's neat to have these varieties kept around and yeah, let's describe them and put them in a tissue culture museum. And if people want to grow them and make them available, great. Right. But like, the truth is they're not the best plants in the world. They're just not right. Yeah, On, on this level, honestly, I think they should be transitioning to that and a, a like germplasm gene bank sort of repository where the private grower can access them more so like, you know, a lot of those things aren't in commercial production for very real reasons that you're alluding to agronomically they're not the best thing yeah so check this out the patent system that we were talking about earlier before where you can get a plant patent in the states and have protection over the variety here's the difference the major difference between the upov system and that plant patent system that exists in the u.s in upov if you're granted the rights to a variety or a cultivar you must make that plant available to home growers one that can grow it without royalty and two um to any other plant breeder that wants to take it and work with it and here's the reason the reasoning behind it plant genetic resources belong to everybody on the planet not one group that found it so if you found something and you bred something that was new and unique sure we're going to give you the rights for 17 or 20 years or whatever it is so that you can benefit commercially from that one clone that you've registered okay but that clone that is new and better somebody else some other plant breeder gets to take it and work with it and and improve upon it now if they only improve upon it slightly like let's use this frostbite example that i gave earlier say i developed a cultivar and somebody came along and and crossed it to something purple and made a purple frostbite. But in all other regards, it was the same as my earlier variety frostbite. That would mean that purple frostbite was a derivative variety of frostbite. And the original plant breeder would be, um, would have a right to a percentage of the royalty. Okay. So you can't just, it's like if I'm going to come along and only slightly improve upon somebody else's work. They get piece. They get part of the royalty. But the idea is that all of humanity gets a plant that's marginally better, right? And eventually, as the breeding continues, that marginally better plant might qualify as its own variety that's not a derivative variety, right? But the idea is that, yeah, the guys that did the work and developed the new stuff, they get to, to have some financial advantage from their work, but the plant becomes available to everybody so that other people can take it and improve upon it that doesn't exist in the plants patent system that works in the states like if you, if you got if you get the registered rights to this plant patent you can license it to the people that you want to but you don't have to give it to anybody else right yeah and one of the reasons like most of these things that we're talking about at least like that i've referred to as potential cultivars that could be described or could be you know whatever the clone onlys they can't be patented they they there's no registration of anything that can happen other than a name that gets recognized on a cultivar list because there's a description that's been published that connected to the type that's all there's no real commercial advantage there for anybody there's just a name taken off the table so somebody in the future can't describe a name that's already been taken and applies to something in our world and so it would be you know very cool for all of these things for an herbarium and a tissue culture sort of gene bank if it you know regulatorily in california it's not really an option because of the way that you have to have a license to touch plants um but yeah that something that could make these things available to the general public because they're that's their primary utility and as you're saying as genetic resources for other people to breed with and to do their own thing if they want to do that because like i know the world doesn't need another you know chem dog sour d cookies etc across but people still have an appetite for it and i think the home breeder is really something that needs to develop a lot more because you know, people can do their own thing in their own little area 
and keep these things going, which I'm all about. Yeah, I, I agree, but they got to be given better tools so they do it right, you know? I mean, I love the enthusiasm of the home breeder, but I wish people would just do a little bit with a little more thought rather than just banging two plants together. But, you yeah. know, it all, it, it, like you said, it all keeps the species alive. It's just as someone that wants to, you know, you wrote that thing on genetic erosion. You know, the home, home breeder is like the, the, the criminal partner of, of, of genetic erosion, really, right? So mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's where my disdain for the practice comes from. And uh, that was an under, like, picked up on piece of that because it's the low, and granted we can say it's prohibition, but to continue the practices post-prohibition is not necessarily ideal. Um, it's not and just maintain it. right? I mean, it's like you said, the, the, the legal system still isn't letting us, I mean, dude, we're like, whatever, how many years are we into legalization here in Canada? Six now? And you still can't buy, you can't walk into a nursery and buy clones to feed your, yeah. your legal four plant home growth. And the fact, like, okay, every other agricultural crop where you have big breeding, lots of the breeding either goes on in, like, the Monsanto big agro-pharmaceutical sort of complex. Aside from that, it's going on in academic institutions. And they don't have the regulatory compliance issues that we've got and the cost where it's like, you know, you've got to do everything that we have to do we have to pay all those costs plus regulatory compliance costs and jump through a million hoops that makes it just completely insane and largely cost prohibitive for anybody to do large scale real breeding of the type that was kind of getting alluded to in the hop uh, discussion earlier today about breeding resistance and just the massive scale of work and effort that's going to go and have to go into that if that's the solution. Twice I've done once. Once was a client that I didn't import for, but another time I was approached by a university prof, and they wanted genetic resources. And one of them I went out to the market and got things for them, but the other one wanted things for me. And they wanted like you know, they didn't want populations. They wanted like five seeds of this and ten <laughs> seeds of that, right? And it's like, if you're supposed to be the professionals and you're contacting the source breeder for like five seeds, I mean Jesus. It just, it's scary, right? And that's, that's you know, I mean, I guess the, the plant is, the species do, is doing okay because there's so many of us saving seed, but I think, you know, the way that we're treating these populations is not very well, not very good, right? Well, one of the concerns, um, you know, with people just kind of banging things together, was that just the narrowing of... The genetics, the potential, yeah. we're isolating it's, things. It's not about the process of anybody doing something that's bad in and of itself. It's that so-and-so gets northern lights from the original guy and then uses two plants to cross together and then sells more seeds and somebody else decides, well, I just spent $200 on these seeds. I should make two more. I should make more. So I've got them, right? And then they cross two more plants together. And it's like the genetic diversity is like every generation. It's just getting narrower and narrower, right? Yeah. And, and it's and it's also it's also remember we're not talking about populations where it's like northern lights is a type where like of the hundred seeds that grow in that family they're all uniform. It's like they're all over the place. So just going in there and randomly grabbing two and mating them, you've now changed what it was from a generation before, and so like you know of the customers of the second reproducer one guy in call it you no, i'm not gonna say utah but one guy on the west coast doing it he's choosing two from ten and the other guy on the east coast is choosing two from eight you know and it's like all and everybody's still calling the thing northern lights right and it's like all, they're all different it's like they're not even a type right so when again it feeds back into that conversation that trevor said earlier about describing things right it's like that way we know hey northern lights is x y and z it grows this tall it's these terpenes it's this cannabinoid range you know the plants look like x y and z right um 
you, we we literally have to describe things. That's what makes something just an individual plant that I that we found in a population to a putative cultivar, right? Like that's part of what the process is: is you're describing something and saying, "Hey, look, I found." this new plant and this is what's new about it it's really high in thiols or it's really high in linalool or it's got a serrated leaf right like it, it 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 doesn't have to be chemical but it has to be hey this is this unique thing about this plant right and if you went to the rose breeders and you said hey what's the new hybrid tea rose for this year they could tell you oh it's got this and that trait Right. Whereas if you went to like a cannabis cup and you said, Hey, what's new about the new strain that you released this year? They'd be like, Oh, it's really great. <laughs> right. I mean, it's like the seed raiders don't even know what it is that's about this stuff because truthfully, everybody's just selling the same things mashed together. Right. Nobody's really, very few people are trying to find new, unique things and registering them. It's just the way it is. Yeah. And if you go through and read them, um, oh, sorry, Chad. Uh, if you go through and read some of the cultivar descriptions, we talked about lavender earlier, where it's typically a chemical description or rose. It's like a flower morphology. Um, I've read them for ivy, and they're unique, distinct cultivars of ivy that were found literally by a person walking down a street and seeing like a, a mutant sport sort of branch that was different from the rest of the plant. Yep. They took a cutting from it, described it, and the description's, you know, a small paragraph in a botanical magazine from, the, like, the 1950s, I believe. And it just describes the shape and the size of the leaf and how it's different from a similar cultivar that is already known and registered and makes the distinction and comparative in a 50-word paragraph, you know? All of the necessary information to register the cultivar was right there for us it could be way more complicated there could be a checklist there could be a whole bunch of characteristics and you know descriptive traits that are included but the point is is that you have to know what the key distinct distinguishing characteristic is and you got to describe it and also kind of circling back on your convert, uh, just to put like some buzzwords for people to look up and research to do. It's about founder effect and genetic drift. So the problem with, it's not that anybody did anything wrong. People got seeds, bred things, kept clones, shared clones, did stuff with cannabis and did some pretty incredible things considering the context of prohibition. And, but if you trace it back and you go to who did what, when, and where did things come from, it's very few plants in terms of the actual early breeding stock. And it got narrowed down incredibly in Amsterdam or in the Netherlands with, you know, haze skunk, Northern Lights essentially being the three. And then once you fast forward to the medical scene, it's kind of gone in like, hourglass sort of like ebb and flow where there's been times of like contraction and expansion but early medical days there was a lot of different things popping off there were lots of different variety and what was going on then it just kind of became cookies and og at least here in california and like those really by the the 2010s dominated every like scene it was those or maybe blue dream if you were making boxes and sending them east um and so <laughs> but the the point is is that there are very few plants that got bred with over time and it keeps narrowing down and there keeps being these clone onlys that get bred with over and over and over again so that's a founder effect a lot of them are related and then on top of that, you've got small populations, so you're going to have genetic drift, and that's for better and for worse. It, you know, you can have genetic drift in terms of like astronomic THC production, higher, you know, all sorts of secondary metabolites. You can also lose all sorts of resistance genes and all sorts of agronomically valuable traits 
that you're not selecting for because you're growing in a tent or in a closet or in, you know, the woods out in the, you know, the hills or whatever the situation may be. And that is what was the problem in terms of the, the genetic diversity of the breeding populations we were working with. And it's not, listen, that's not exclusive to cannabis. I mean, corn breeders in the United States, they develop these super sweet, high sugar um, corn varieties for fruit or for uh, corn sugar, for corn syrup production. And they grow like stink, but they manage to, in the breeding process, uh, remove beta caryophylline production from the roots. They just accidentally selected a plant or plants in the breeding process that didn't have those traits or had mutations in those traits. Beta caryophylline is a it's a terpene, sesquiterpene that's kind of bitter tasting. So it would be like an antifeedant to bugs biting the roots, right? So, but again, they were driving so fast looking for the corn that they weren't paying attention to all these other things, right? So we're for sure doing that with cannabis as well. There's like absolutely we're doing that, and uh, it. It, it just takes something like HVLD or broad mites to come along and start exposing all those weaknesses that we've bred into the lines, right? So, you know, it's interesting that, that you were talking cultivars, uh, Trevor, Macintosh apples was was uh, a discovered cultivar. I think somebody bought the old Macintosh farm and there was an apple tree that had been that was growing on the farm and they took a cutting off of it and described it and that's the Macintosh that's grown all over the world. Right. So, I mean, you can discover varieties, right? Like you don't have to, you don't have to make them. Everybody, you know, I've heard a lot of these geneticists say, oh, to get it to be a true cultivar, it has to be described and bred for six generations with notes. And it's like, that's just not true. You know, you, you can't describe, and Pinot Noir, or sorry, Pinot Gris and Pinot Blanc were both uh, mutant sports that were growing off of a Pinot Noir grapevine. And somebody was walking through the vineyard and noticed that one branch had, you know, whitish pink grapes r- rather than the dark brown grapes. So they are the dark purple grapes. So they took cuttings off of that part of the branch and propagated it and registered the variety. So, yeah, it, it is just describing what's different about it and showing that, hey, this thing that I have is different from other ones. That's really all. What is. I'm sorry, please. Go, no, that's go. it. That's it. Oh. Uh, what is the likelihood the person's environment or terroir would create such a difference to give a different expression versus, you know, the East Coast versus West Coast? How would someone navigate that for patenting? Well, that would be considered probably a trade secret. Like that, there would something that would go into because it's not truly. You, I don't think you can patent terroir or your variety, but like it's kind of like the special sauce of the farm. Right. right, you might think okay. of it like that. So that would be a trade secret a form of IP. Um, so that falls under a separate category of IP and um, protections, appellations, um, uh, something of origins. Uh, yeah. Domin- right. Dominion of origin, dominate. Yeah, domi- yeah, yeah. And so what happens there, and California actually created a program, and it's part of the, the Prop 64 like legislation that ended up passing, where it was mandated that they had to create an Appalachia program. I was on the working group with um, the Origins Council and a lot of different other people who um, are interested in these kinds of things. And essentially, there was the working group. The working group came up with some rules. The rules weren't necessarily um, to everybody's liking. And so there was a rider bill that essentially just dictated how it was going to be set up. Um, We'll see how it ends up developing and working here in California. I think there are some issues with the way that it was done because the, the working group program didn't really end up being the the mechanism through which they actually decided it. They just sort of did an end around. But um, if you have, it was about creating standards, practices, and um, having a specific place with different environmental characteristics, all of which have to be described and maintained and make the character the actual 
terroir or the the Appalachia unique from something else. So let's say you're growing Blue Dream just as an example. Perhaps this is the best Blue Dream ever and yours is special. So you've got certain standards and practices for your cultivation, your harvesting, your curing, all the different things that go into producing your special Blue Dream. You've got your special environment that makes it so that there are unique characteristics that are described and associated with the Blue Dream produced on your farm and the farms around you, I think, um, because I don't think a single farm can set up an Appalachia of origin in California. I think you have to have at least two farms. Anyways, point is, is that in this little area, in this valley or whatever, you guys produce the Fire Blue Dream. You've described it and established it in an Appalachian of origin as one of the cultivars that you is included and, and like described, et cetera, then that's how you would protect your terroir or have a, an Appalachian of origin associated with cannabis in the state of California. And that's only in California. It can happen in all different places. However, other places want to do it. But a lot of it, it's all built off of European and international uh, legal frameworks um, and has a lot to do with efforts after um, like the original one with wine had to do with there was a blight and the blight knocked out um, I think all the wine grapes in Bordeaux and then after the blight there was a massive overplanting and there was overproduction and substandard quality was getting produced and the like heady Bordeauxian sort of winemakers were like, our shit's good, that stuff's trash, we need to protect this. And that was kind of how it all emerged in the wine world. And it applies to like clocks or Swiss watches are an Appalachian of origin, um, Cuban tobacco, it's a whole bunch of different, different things. Wagyu beef. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. It's bizarre. Yeah, that phylloxera, that phylloxera blight that, that wiped out most of the vineyards in France and all, all over Spain was um, when they came to the New World, they dug up North American grapevines, wrapped them in burlap, and brought it back to Europe and planted them in the vineyards. Speaking of uh, phytosanitary. <laughs> There is a uh, a bug called phylloxera. It's root aphids, actually, and it destroyed the entire industry for like I think decades. It was like a huge problem because it got in and just spread from vineyard to vineyard to vineyard. They they eventually learned that they could graft the North, the European vines onto the North America rootstock and plant them, and that they were resistant then. Speaking of root compounds. Are we ever going there with cannabis? We should. Using rootstock. I don't know about necessarily using rootstock, but maybe, I mean, we might go to rootstock, um, but we also might go to at least like screening populations for compounds that might make plants resistant for roots. I mean, it's kind of like tissue culture, right? Like everybody's talking tissue culture all day. There's plants that you put into tissue culture. They're just not happy, right? They don't like it. And so it's kind of like we've been selecting plants all along that grow well outside and grow in these specialized indoor environments but we haven't done a very good job of selecting for plants that do well in tissue culture right and that's like another layer of selection that we can do but sure, certainly we can also select for plants that might be resistant for outdoor growing and I, it's just one reason reason region we haven't looked at in the plant in this uh you know in this kind of development those are the things that matter though. I mean, if you look at the developments that are being done in the breeding world, like we're talking about these resistance genes and Aurora has just found another one. Um, those are the things that are gonna change agriculture, right? I mean, it seems like it's like, okay, so you found a resistance gene. Does it, does it make the weed any better or smell different? No, but it sure makes it a lot better to produce, right? And that's, that's incredibly important. I mean, if you, you take away even from an economic perspective, take away the, the, the necessity to spray crops, like the labor and the cost that goes associated with spraying, right? I mean, not to mention there's less stuff that gets sprayed on a product that people are gonna consume, right? So like these are good things to develop. There's, there's, a, there's a reason to make plants bulletproof, right? Or as bulletproof as we can. 
So if, if you were to insert some sort of gene and just hypothetically, let's say this could easily happen, you could do that. Is it going to make cannabis mutant, dangerous, uh, less enjoyable? Yeah, I mean, cannabis, no. No, it won't. It'll make it more comfortable for the people that are, like, concerned about consuming it. They're afraid of consuming a GMO. It might make it more uncomfortable for them. But that's the only kind of thing that's going to change. I don't think that we'll probably head down that path. To me, it's like tissue culture, okay? Like, to me, tissue culture is not a process that every plant is going to pass through tissue culture. Like, the clone that you plant in your grow is probably not going to come from tissue culture. Did that clone get cut from a mother that came from tissue culture? Maybe. Right? So tissue culture will play a role in the development of mother plants, but I don't think that every plant is going to come from a test tube. There's just no need for it, right? And it adds too much cost and time, and it slows everything down. Um, I think that the genetic changes that we'll see will allow it to, like, like, for example, breeding strategies right like there's going to be crisp there's crisper ways that you can you can manipulate genes that allow you to then take a plant and hybridize it and that clone ends up in a seed form in the plant in the in the seed right so it's kind of like putting clone seeds that's that's really what all of agri or all of breeding for agriculture is trying to do you're trying to take a clone only type or a type and put it into a seed line so that every seed that you plant comes up looks like that type, right? And there's, anyway, the, the point is there's crisper manipulations you can do to a plant that allow you to pollinate it with a donor, like a pollen source, but that pollen, the genetics, the genetic material in that pollen doesn't end up in the seeds. Only the genetic material from the mother ends up in the seeds. Um, so like, to me, that's more likely to be the type of genetic change that we see get made. I know, the, I hope the, the question would probably be coming, that, that does that mean that those seeds, that next generation seeds have that genetic change? And the answer is no. There's ways that you can do it that although the mother plant was genetically modified, that genetic trans, that genetic modification doesn't end up in the offspring. So the offspring are not genetically modified organisms. And one, just to bring it back to discussion earlier, um, it may not be necessary, but it may be necessary um, if somebody wants to go down this route. But uh, during Zamir's uh, presentation on hop latent and during the panel discussion, I know he mentioned that in hops, the way that, so we know that there is transmission through seeds right, of hop latent. Um, there's not transmission through seeds in hops of hop latent. And the reason for it apparently is that the male pollen um, does something, um, I can't remember, I think, whatever chops up um, DNA or RNA um, uh, nuclease or whatever it is, it has an enzyme that it produces that chops up the DNA, the, mRNA or the RNA of the hop latent so that the pollen isn't transmitting um, into the next generation. That was at least the mechanism that he described. Now, cannabis and hops are related. We would need, somebody had asked earlier, how do you find a genetic marker? One way that you find genetic markers is you find genes that are similar to things that are related to what you're looking for or genes that are already associated with different resistances because a lot of resistance traits exist as genes that are throughout multiple genera or species because it's basically they've been adapted and then passed on. Um, we could look at hops. We can identify the genes associated with the uh, disruption of the passage or transmission of pollen um, hop latent or that is a vector perhaps reduce seed transmission that way or eliminate it from known male like from males to clean females anyway that's one area of either targeting the genome to look for a homolog in 
cannabis and a gene that produces a similar enzyme in cannabis or doing something in terms of CRISPR, if that's what somebody wanted to do. And that seems like a reasonable application of CRISPR technology, not that I'm one to hop on that Nature, train. you know, nature usually has the answer. So that's right. Look, look at how it was solved and try to replicate it there. The, the one thing, and I don't know if I'm being too specific here, but you said male pollen. So does that, does a reverse plant count as male pollen? Um, he actually did say both. He, um, okay, okay. he said that Just it checking. was, uh, I think Zamir in there, um, in his study, well, I don't know if it would be both technically, but like the, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll have to look at the actual literature that Zamir mentioned, but I know when he did talk about the transmission or potential transmission from males to females, um, he mentioned that hoplaten is present in the anthers, and so they have detected it in male sex organs. So that's a, a high likely transmission point, and one of the reasons we're seeing it in the offspring. And one of the reasons why apparently you don't see it in um, hops. There was there's a there is one paper on transmission in hops, and they conclude that there's no transmission, but the paper doesn't actually show that. Like it, it, it can be transmitted up to like 10%. I think. So I don't know if that mechanism is a hundred percent. And knows? that's another thing they were saying that like, it's the likelihood of a hundred percent sort of like a uh, qualitative trait that just solves the problem is highly unlikely here. And we're dealing with more of a multifactorial quantitative trait resistance of having to stack identifying plants that are females that are cultivars that are resistant and at least um you know uh, are able to tolerate and exist with uh the the pressure of the viroid um those sorts of identifying those plants and then combining that with a breeding strategy, tissue culture and testing and sanitary protocols. It's like a, a kitchen sink approach. Yeah. Are you a uh, Faden Ryan? I know you've had a long day. No, I'm fine. I'm good. Okay. Okay. I guess we never heard from Jackson. Hey, uh, yeah, he, he may be pulling up here in the next, um, 20 minutes, yeah. hopefully. I was, I was just going to see uh, if Peter was still listening. I was about to text Peter. Uh, 8 p.m., question mark, question mark, question mark. Oh, here's Peter. Okay, he's, he's coming on shortly. So uh, Nice. Peter, let me know if we're going to do same link or separate link. And then we'll we'll get that we'll get that going. Uh, but yeah, being being on the uh, west coast over here, we we go to bed last. <laughs> so <laughs> you can understand if you uh, if you need to uh, take out of here today. But um, no, I do appreciate your time, and this has been a great conversation. You know, one of the things that you're talking about earlier too is just like phylogenetics. Uh, there was some panels on that trevor today um i don't know if you have a subject through there another one that you guys can go off of i mean eleanor and i talked about it briefly mostly because she produced a paper on the subject not too long ago um it was a it's an interesting paper it's pretty exhaustive it's one of the um it's one of the few papers that has um, at least produced here in the States um, that's done some geographic origin phylogeny and sort of associated genetics with certain regions and plants from those regions. And so that was cool. Um, it's always great to talk with Eleanor. Okay. Well, may maybe, um, you know, it does sound like Jackson will be yeah. on here yeah. shortly, maybe another 20 minutes or so. Um, maybe we could do a little bit of a lightning round of nomenclature. The communication. What, <laughs> what are your, like, top three words that you wish people would get right, maybe? 
or that we've completely just abused because that's how cannabis does it, man. We don't care what the definition is. If we're all saying it, that that's what it is. Well, I mean, I would have to go with strain, obviously, but I think the world is tired of hearing me go on about that. So I'm just going <laughs> to okay, yeah. bypass that. You know, interesting, you know, interesting one for people to learn. Sativa actually means cultivated or useful. Those are really kind of the two uses of the word. And, um, you know, these words were written down like a long time ago, right? Linnaeus, we're talking many, many, like 100 years ago, well above 100 years ago. And, and he wrote about cannabis sativa, which was European hemp, right? Like that's what was around him. He had never seen drug cannabis in his lifetime. But hemp was grown all over the place. You know, people grew up for cordage and seeds and all sorts of stuff. So if you were a European, you'd come across the hemp plant. Um, hemp has these quite long slender fingers at least the european northern european hemp does also when you grow it for fiber and you've been breeding it for fiber for a couple of hundred years like their ancestors has been had been one thing that you do when you want long fibers is you you breed for long internodes right so so the spaces between the internodes were quite long and then the the laminae or the fingers on the leaves were quite slender Right. And so when the stoners came along in like the 60s and started looking about cannabis and somebody decided that they were going to go to the library and look up this narrow leafed plant that they grew from Mexican or Colombian seeds that ended up in the United States, what they ended up finding in the literature was that it was probably European or it was probably cannabis sativa, not realizing that cannabis sativa was actually describing hemp, not drug cannabis. That they had found a new drug cannabis that also had slender leaves. Wow, sorry, that's sorry. <laughs> doing some glass blowing. Um, yeah, but you know that's how we we accidentally created in our minds that like these equatorial plants with the long thin, thin leaves. We didn't create it in our minds. We we created it in our entire culture that sativa is now synonymous with these equatorial plants without really understanding that that's not Linnaeus, what Linnaeus meant. He wasn't describing those plants. He was describing the useful plants that were cultivated for fiber. Right. And so. Which, which is kind of funny too, because you know, the European have European, uh, not near the equator. No, not at all. <laughs> but the morphology was the same, I guess. Well, it was it was similar in enough way that you could confuse the two the two descriptions. Maybe it also shows that the descriptors the descriptors weren't great. Like, you know, maybe in our characterization or describing the variety, we didn't do a very good job. Again, he was doing it like in the context of this is in the 1700s, right? So, very different times, and he didn't even know about drug plants. So, but it, it does cut. You know, when you're lumping and you're or you're splitting. It does come down to like how detailed do you want to be, right? Because the more detailed you are in your description, the better you are. You you've been at identifying the uniqueness of your plant, right? Because somebody might have a plant that's ninety nine percent the same, but it fails in regards to one important character that you have described that defines the character, right? So there there are good reasons for being very accurate and um, um systematic in your description right and for taking really nice herbarium specimens um i've looked at hundreds of them recently and it's incredible the quality of certain uh herbarium specimens that have lasted over 100 years now compared to others that are 50 years and it looks like some of these plants are just like smashed messes that are glued to a piece of paper um and but then others are really really nice and that's that's something that needs to you know i, I just uh eleanor's herbarium sheets are always quite nice and that's something that i appreciate because you really do see the morphological distinctions and the traits that are being you know, characterized at least vegetatively um, compared to some of these other, uh, I mean, it's, it's crazy. If you look, I'll post some on my Instagram, but 
there are some really uh, shoddy uh, herbarium specimens out there that are like, even like if you go all the way back, there is a specific um, specimen that is apparent that was grown by Linnaeus and was in his possession um, when he was making the characterization. And there's another, there's two others that are held by the uh, Linnaeus Society in London. And those, for whatever reason, aren't included as the, the lectotype, the specific, you know, all taxonomies based off of an individual type and a specific description, like we're saying. And there is a specific plant and a description that is associated with that plant. And that plant still exists and is part of the Clifford Hortic. I mean, he's he, everything the dude wrote was in Latin, so it's like Cliffordus <laughs> Horticus or some shit, but it's right. like the Clifford Horticulture. And, um, but that's where he, uh, Linnaeus grew and had in his garden uh, a specimen of cannabis sativa as he described it. And yeah. And that's, that's still preserved somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's wow. a, there's a herbarium specimen, uh, that still exists. Yeah. I, I am obviously not a herbarium and I'm, I'm like so sad, but like we were talking about the freak show earlier. I grew some and I thought it would be, you know, I'm just like, Oh, those leaves are so cool. Did a shitty job of mounting them. And then I've had this sitting in the room and the light from the lights are just bleaching everything. So mm -hmm. I'm just like, you know what? This is like garbage, but it's still no, for somebody cool. who's never like grown something like that. It's pretty freaking cool. That's yeah. <laughs> it's totally cool. Yeah, I, I dig those things. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not the example to follow for preservation. <laughs> it's well, better I mean, than the ones things, I've got. <laughs> these things have to last for hundreds of years. I mean, it's kind of it's an insane undertaking to even try to preserve them. But you know, now that we have digital uh, preservation technology, I mean, I can see that would probably help a lot. I don't really know the. I mean, they're cool artifacts to have Linnaeus's plant, but how useful is that for identifying? I mean, you can't even handle the thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. A lot of the old specimens are just, you know, it's cool, but you know, it's to my mind, it's only a neat picture. And unless you really want to get into a fight over the, the monotypic polytypic, species debate which yeah, like, is like, silly again look it's like hillig's work hillig's work was really interesting yeah, carl hillig they, they showed that um they they grew seeds from different regions around the world and then they did some chemical analysis on them and showed that the terpenes and some other chemical markers were different between them great that's really cool here's the problem they grew like one or two plants from each type mm -hmm. so if they grew like 30 plants of one type, they might have shown that, hey, there was chemical variation even in that one type, right? So that the one that they chose might not have really been an archetype for that whole variety. And, and so that type of data in the scientific literature is non-existent. Like we don't have any varieties from back when where anybody has systematically characterized populations, right? So it's like we've got these like one data point where you know a data point would be fine again if we were growing tomatoes and every plant was essentially the same but as anybody that has grown cannabis knows especially with hybridization the genetic variation within the species is very large right like chemical phenotypic morphological you know agronomic like however you want to characterize it there's always tons of variation no matter which way you're looking at cap cannabis if you're growing from seed and uh so when we're relying on studies to draw like these understandings where it's like oh yeah we grew two seeds from afghanistan and this is what we know right I mean, and yeah. and the to be clear the samples that they had were you know all of their afghan samples um not all there were a couple pakistani samples that were seized from like pakistani like uh, police authorities or whatever um but everything else was like Dutch seed bank sort of stuff. It was Afghan one. It was a, a number of those different varieties. Um, and on top of that, 
there's there's basically Hillig's work. There's Ernest Small's work, who also has all sorts of like problems and issues with the data and what's no, going on. He had no Afghans. He had and no he, Afghans. Nothing, nothing wide. He had nothing broadly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I went through and looked at all of those, like the tables and everything. And you had mentioned it to me, and that's kind of why I went on this tangent. But um, he, like, forty-two percent of the type one high THC, which you know the the numbers and how he characterized them are kind of silly, but um. 42% of them were char characterized as type four sex, which just means they didn't mature. They died of frost. Yeah. Because they were grown in Ottawa. <laughs> yeah. So they were growing like African and like Indian. Columbia. Yeah. Like all these different things all over the world. And yeah, so it didn't really work out. 42% of the like data set was just essentially trash because they didn't even make it. And then there was on top of it, there was no broadleaf drug type, which exactly. is like half the variation, right? Yeah, yeah. And then the only other like study that I think kind of in theory, I, I can't speak to it personally because I've never read it um, because I believe it's in Russian. Um, but McPartland wrote a recent paper. It's the last thing that I've seen that he's published. And it was really interesting about... Uh, Tetiana Serbiankova, um, and she was a Russian like botanist who worked under Vavilov and did. I think like she, the three of them are the people who have done the largest sort of population studies and looking at like large scale populations and describing them. But having never actually read her work like firsthand, I can't speak to any of the specifics. But it seems like every single one so far that I've seen has major flaws. And that's like the entire basis of this the right. taxonomy always, feud. Everything's always gonna have flaws, but it's like doesn't mean that they're useless as a data point. You know? It, it, I don't know. There's two ways to go on that one, but the, there's a really interesting. Someone should do a documentary on the on the Russian hemp and the Vavilov, the the work in Russian hemp and the Vavilov Institute, because there's a whole really interesting story there. You know, Vavilov is this super important plant guy in the plant world, but they did some work on hemp and collecting hemp in Russia specifically because that's kind of where ruderalis or proto ruderalis is said to have come from. And um, so anyway, they collected a bunch of work, but obviously the Soviet Union fell apart, right, at, at, a, at a certain point in time. And the Vavilov Institution, Institute people that were doing the work weren't getting paid. Like, there was no money. Like, it just wasn't coming. And, you know, people were, like, n even not eating, right? So the seed collection became quite a, an interesting, tasty item during that time, right? And these people went without and protected the seeds. And, and anyway, there's like, you know, D Watson, David, he gave them Sam. He donated them a bunch of, of uh, some, some funds during that time and um, through one of his companies in Europe and to help, to help fund them, right, just to keep going on the research. It's funny. He gets such a badge. People talk nasty stuff about him and all these crazy DEA agent lies and stuff. But if they actually knew the amount of work that he has done for cannabis out of his own pocket, like people would be shocked. Um, but anyway, there's a whole real story there about the Vavlov Institute and uh, and folk and John. You know, John obviously is is one person to tell it because he's been there. Right? He knows all these people for thirty years. So anyway, sorry. Yeah, no, no, that honestly, um, this kind of brings up something that I've noticed just going through the history of cannabis research. Um, there's times and places that are epicenters of research. Yeah. And Russia from really the 1920s on to the 1940s was a just key epicenter for essentially everything that like Schultz and other people who wanted to take a polytypic interpretation of the species. A lot of that research was based out of there, but also 
all the hemp research with Bosca. I'm probably butchering his name, but uh, the Hungarians. Yeah, Bosca. Bosca. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're hungry, but it was behind the curtain at that time, I believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally in the fifties, and um, and yeah, and so there was a, a lot of research and work done there. Then there's a bunch of research by small in Canada and like systematic research that goes on there and kind of as a corollary, the, the Schultes research that happens. And um, then all this really interesting, weird pharmacopoeia research that was done in the 19, really from the 1880s or 50s, I guess, all the way up to like the 1930s. And then that just cuts off. But I've just gone through the Journal of American Pharmacology and read all the back issues of those that reference cannabis that I can find. And it's, it's wild, the research, um, both how crappy it was because a lot of it just involved yeah. getting dogs high. Um, but it's meaningless, yeah. unfortunately, but it's interesting. It's from a historical in uh, perspective. It's interesting from a scientific perspective. You're like, this is all <laughs> meaningless. <laughs> 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 maybe there is some THC in these things, but even then it's hard to, hard to judge. Yeah. Uh, oh, did yeah. you come um, across the injectable THC? Well, okay. the injectable cannabis. Two that things one, on that. That was one, something that I did not know about, really. So the dog, like, test people um, at Park Davis um, injected an ounce of the a fluid ounce of their extract into a dog to try and see if it, they could kill it essentially. And it slept for two days and woke up and was essentially fine. Um, they like, it was just stupid shit that they did. Um, and so there was an injectable that they described the procedure and it was injectable. Um, and yeah, so that was that was the research that they were doing, and you can find stuff on that. Um, the most interesting thing is really just what, um, like the introduction of different genetics, at least from my perspective, that was kind of interesting because they're doing research trying to figure out how to grow drug cannabis and are collecting it from different places and growing it in different places in the United States. And there are some reports on that. And it's kind yeah. of, it's, it's interesting, but yeah, it's, it's purely from a historic standpoint and seeing where we were a hundred, you know, 150 years ago or plus and like where we are now. And it's, it's yeah, just... well, it's, it's really interesting too, because the deeper you get into it, you start tying in, like you said, oh, this was going on in the United States at this point in time, and Russia was doing this, and Hungary was doing whatever, China, there's a ton of research over there. There was a whole period of time where the Japanese, the Shoyama, yeah. they, his lab, they did like a whole bunch of discovery. They discovered the CBC acid synthase. They discovered CBD acid synthase. Um, or at least the CBD acid enzyme, I think is what it was, not the, not the synthase. Gene. but yeah um and then the italians did a whole bunch of work as well so mm -hmm. yeah they were some of the first to characterize and deal with fusarium well they've had they have a huge hemp industry but they also in the pharmaceutical world and in tissue culture like they were doing tissue culture in like early to mid 90s and and starting to use genetic te techniques for Again, sex. Sex has always been one. Everybody's always interested in the sex of cannabis to try and figure out because you got off types, right? Or these intermediate types um, that are problematic for drug growers. So, um, yeah, everybody's always looking at that. And that goes back, like, you, you go back to, like, 1910, 1909, you're writing articles about, they're writing about sex. Yeah, yeah, Schneider, I think, was wow. his name. There was a guy in Ohio who did a lot of research, and you can find all the information about, you know, environmental variables for causing hermaphrodites well described in the literature in the 1920s. Yeah, well, I mean, I remember, mm -hmm. I remember reading one of the wow. ones in like 1909 and they're like, oh, yeah, the whole they published that article, the article. And it's like, oh, yeah, they had they had they had one change that they'd done between the two treatment groups. 
and they they said yeah this change caused you know in, intersexuality or whatever but one of them was grown in the summer and one of them was grown from like over december mm -hmm, mm -hmm. January, right it's like totally different lighting conditions totally different lighting variables that's way more likely to be what causes the intersect but yeah yeah be, for history it's really cool all that stuff is really cool for science you just gotta not take too much from it right it's interesting because it's the same problems but it's like their answers weren't the right answers you know we're still trying to figure out the intersex thing right right who or where is leading this sort of research today or who will who's going to be leading it in five years um i mean there's a lot of different universities there's so the like Canadians. the united states Okay. Or well, I mean, Canada, there's different wow. research Canada. groups all over. Um, like in the U.S., there's uh, you see a lot of published papers coming out of certain universities and research groups, and you can kind of through that see who's leading academic research into cannabis. There's um, it, it's tough for the states right now because of the federal funding shit and the drug restrictions that that exist in the in the way that the US is set up with funding and the way you treat drugs. It's not federally legalized, right? So universities can't really touch, they can touch hemp, they can't touch drug cultivars. So University of Cornell, for example, they've got a fantastic hemp program. They're figuring out all sorts of really interesting stuff about auto flowering genes and, and you know, gene dosing effects to get like early, really early, you know, mid harvest, late harvest. So we'll, we'll be able to eventually breed for all of those custom time harvest time profiles. But they figured it out in hemp and hemp crosses now it needs to be shown in drug types. But the point is they can do that kind of work. They can't do work related to the drug synthesis in the same way, right? So in Canada, we've got a couple of universities that are doing stuff. There's a guy out of... Um, Uh, University of Laval in Quebec and uh, Davoud and he's doing some great stuff. They've got a whole, he's a, got a whole, geno he's done genomic selections on all, all sorts of crops, corn, soybean, wheat. He's worked with all the big bad boy companies for ag company, ag tech, and he's got a license to grow like 6,000 plants at his university and a lab and a little facility to do it. And, you know, genomic analysis and chemical analysis. So, I would assume that eventually they'll start turning out some pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. And I see actually uh, Justin Cooney here in chat mentioned Israel because, you know, I, I'm typically thinking about studying the medicinal effects. And as we're having this conversation, I'm like, well, you know, that really is two different distinct fields. You know, one person is looking for like the medicinal effects, Israel, Spain, Tennessee, a lot of that, but we're actually talking more genomic plant based is there an overlap at these sort of universities that maybe are looking for those? Or are they really just kind of two separate worlds? No, it's, it's hard to do everything, right? It's hard yes. to do all that stuff. So Israel, he's right. Israel has some incredible researchers like Miri's doing some great, great stuff. And I think they've had a little bit more difficulty with their production system, the, the ability to move around plants around the world and that kind of stuff. Um, so it's limited certain areas of development, but they've also done all sorts of different types of genomic development on the plants that they do have. And uh, their medical system is set up in such a way that you can do a lot of experimentation. So, you know, with patients, they've got a huge, like... In the hospital. Or yeah, but it really, it, they do use it. Like the society, it's accepted in society to use cannabis for medical purposes. And it's all comes through like this legalized system or the vast majority of it does right so they they do a lot of controlled studies how goes man cool hey, welcome, welcome aboard hey guys how's it going good man good. Thank, thanks for joining us it's been a long day on fcp and uh these gentlemen have been up here for a couple hours but i don't want to stand in the way of greatness so please carry on you guys <laughs> Yeah, no welcome, it Jackson. It's me every once in a while, but uh, I'll probably cut out for about 20 or 30 seconds, and then I'll switch back on. 
Okay. Burton. I think he's having some tech issues, but no they'll, they'll be worked out. Typical of the mountains, right? Trevor, you, you've escaped the mountains, though, haven't you? Um, I'm in town now, yeah. Okay. So, But town here is still shitty internet. But yeah, so, but other research institutes, um, yeah, I can't think of any off the top of my head. I, you know, um, Arno Hayes Camp did his research. I don't know if Better Can is still doing work in Holland, but um, that was another group that was primarily focused on medical and like chemotype analysis. Um, yeah, their work was, it was, I mean, Vedrican was a small company and the, the Dutch system was first. I did a class with them. I did this thing they called the master class with them. I think it was like 2011 and, uh, I got to go and see their production system and spend some time at their university lab there. They had a, they had the only license or more or less the only license in Holland that was selling to the pharmacies and the pharmacy market was tiny because anybody could just buy from dispenser from the coffee shops. Right. And typically the coffee shop weed was seen as better by the patients. And so I think a lot of their science was kind of like, in my opinion, it was, it was designed to show the safety of the bedroom can products. Right. Like it was, I would call it borderline marketing, <laughs> but it, it did become, so like Arno, you know, opened a lab out of that and they got Justin Fischetic in there um, and they did the Chemovar to Cultivar or Cultivar to Chemovar paper where they essentially started cataloging a couple of different varieties that Bedrocan had been growing. And that was some of the first like, you know, publicly available terpene data up until that point, people weren't really you know, the labs certainly in California weren't testing for it. There was a few years where the labs were just <laughs> were talking to someone, someone from SC and they said like their first years, they weren't even working at SC at the time, but it was just watching every, every chromatograph come in. It was just THC, THC, THC. Like all the results were the same. You know, there was no, there was nobody even had CBD back then. Did you ever do any work with CBD, Jackson? Uh, I wound up doing work with CBD um, on accident just because I tend to go with whatever plants I really like. And so I wound up with some things. Uh, my buddy, Barry, back in the day, he had like this really killer plant and he bred it and bred it and he got it really down to be like very consistent, really nice pure line. And he's like, I don't know. He goes, I smoke it. I feel good. I get high. But when I sell it to people, they tell me it's, it's, it's no stone. It doesn't get them high, you know? And I was like, well, damn, I don't know. But I, I, I want to grow it, you know? And um, I grew it for a little while. And I actually lost his line of it and wound up getting back um, it basically through other, other ways. I had um, something that was a cross of his stuff from my buddy from before I got his seeds, before I got Barry seeds. And then um, I got a similar thing from someone else who had got it from the guy he got it from long before. And so I wound up with this thing and what it was, was, you know, it was covered in resin and it turned out that um, it was just full of CBD, you know? So w w like when you're talking about the early days at SC and stuff, they were they were looking for CBD and if people had something and it had like 0.3% or 1.5%, then it climbed up to be higher. And when people had more than yeah. a couple percent THC, everybody was like, whoa, we got mind blowing numbers. And yeah. little did, did I know that I had this stuff that was all like, you know, 15%, whatever it was, 15%, 20% CBD. Um, but luckily because I liked that the plant was really, um, really like, uh, easy to bend without snapping like a lot of stuff like a lot of the cushions and things like um i don't know a lot of stuff has really really dry brittle stems and 
this one was really cool because you could really train it and everything you crossed it with it kind of got that thing where you could move it around a lot and super it was from over the hill here towards the coast for years and years so it was super resistant to uh, mold and mildew and it um didn't use much water because it was like old gorilla stuff and um so everything that that is in it's really easy to lean it towards cbd if you want to and um so i think everything that i have that's high in cbd comes from that family and um there, there's some good ones. There's some cool ones. But I, uh, had I been just looking for CBD, it would have never happened. But because of the, the look and the color and the, and the way the plant's actual structure and just general morphology and like texture of the tissue and the way that made it behave for all these practical reasons, uh, it translated to being something that stuck around and wound up being CBD stuff. So that's the CBD stuff that I've worked with. I didn't really jump on like the can of tonic and the ACDC and stuff when it came around. And I had people give me plants of it, but I didn't know what it was. And I was like Googling and they were from Harborside and um, I like grew them and didn't keep them. And that was the year that I first saw russet mites and I got rid of all these plants. And so maybe I would have done more work with the classic ones, but right around that time was when I started really realizing like, wow, these are consistently CBD. Cause you'd see it. Somebody would grow stuff. They test and you see a little bit and you know, you, you don't know how consistent that is. But then after a while it started to be like, okay, so basically all these things that are a little more bendy with the purple stems and those kind of leaves and they have this look. Um, it turns out that that's just kind of, there's like a lot of, a lot of linkage in there between these visual things and the and the uh, and the chemotype, so it's pretty cool um, that I just happened to get those because um, they weren't real. Pra they were practical for reasons that I liked, and they weren't at all. I got them during the time when, um, like, I saw them way back in the day and got a little bit of it, and I got a little bit of it back and worked with it, but I was kind of growing stuff nobody wanted by growing that because it wasn't the potent sour and og and even purple urkel and um all the stuff that was big at the time so that's that's how i wound up with some cbd stuff but i didn't ever like i've done very little uh analytics on everything it kind of just comes from giving people stuff they test it i get back you know oh we tested all these and there was they were ranged from here to there and um a lot of cool ratios and then a couple that wound up just being um like my grape soda skunk it's just cbd it's like i i haven't uh we've just been testing on the little on the little purple pro it doesn't tell you how low the thc is but it's like high teens cbd less than two percent thc and i have a feeling that it could be kind of just gone because it's so so they're so consistently high um in the one in the one thing it doesn't leave a lot of room when it's if it's below two percent those aren't fully accurate but they definitely work you, we tried you know different things i was like okay i think these are all cbd let's try them okay this is a related line but this one gets me really high i think it's and then we try those and it's like okay these are all falling in this range of thc these are all falling in this range of cbd and then you kind of get an idea but you know i don't i don't pay for lab work um and so I don't wind up with a bunch of COAs on everything unless, you know, I enter it in a contest or someone else does or someone gets it tested. You know, it's like, okay, these are all falling in this range of THC. These are all falling in this range. And then you kind of get an idea, but, you know, I don't. I don't a long delay. Not work. Oh. Um, and I'll just mute Trevor's mic for the moment. Coming, coming in hot. Sorry, guys. Time traveler, Tra Trev. Yeah, it's Trevor. You're you're all good, uh, Jackson. Get up there. So sorry to interrupt the flow, though. Uh, you guys, you know, CBD. <laughs> that that sounds interesting. The um, high teens, low THC. What what sort of plans would you have with a plant like that? Well. That one, the grape soda skunks one that I've really inbred hard. And so it's like a really, uh, really consistent true breeding line. And so I've been just using it to make hybrids. 
So it's kind of cool. Like I crossed it with animal cookies and that was one of the first animal cookies F ones that I saw that was just like sexually stable across the board, which usually animal cookies, whatever you cross it with, you're going to wind up getting 10 to, you know, generally it's like 25% is just prone to intersex. Maybe you could keep them from Herman out, but it's real uh, unstable that way. Um, but they came out really cool. And then some of them were like super potent, you know. Um, were these the ones that came up with just the super thicky stems? Like right away, you, you posted a picture a couple of weeks back um, of just some babies, maybe. Yeah, and they, they start they start purple. They grow purple the whole time. And I mean, uh, people have said that, uh, you know, like uh, Brandon Rust is like, yeah, if you if you take tissue sample, samples on something with purple stems like that, you're going to see it has a deficiency in something. And I, I, I wouldn't know. But I do know that they're so genetically prone to it that it's um, it's almost like it's a feature instead of a bug at that point. And I, and I can use that a little bit to track the CBD. Um, it seems to be linked. I haven't seen like as many tests as I would need to say that like completely conclusively. But every time I've ever told somebody to look for that, they come back with the high numbers. Um, in any of the things, in any of the polyhybrids that that's in. So when you see that, it's kind of cool because you're like, okay, there's four things in this and all the ones with purple stems are high CBD and the others aren't necessarily. So um, it seems to be some type of a marker. Um, but, you know, you'd have to really do serious um, studies on it to tell. But, uh, but yeah, they just come up and they, anyway, they look purple the whole time and I, I don't know. Um, I, it, it could be that it is that they are deficient, but if it's deficient, it's like how I like, like, like I'm like melanin deficient. You know what I mean? It's like not going away. You're not going to stick me in the sun and give me what I need to produce melanin. I'm only going to get a little bit. I'm always going to be, you know, have the European skin. So they're purple, they're grow purple, you know, and it's, they're super interesting like that. And, uh, they get really nice big flowers. They're a little leafy. They're a little impractical in some ways. That's why I crossed it with animal cookies because animal cookies is really pretty. It's super resinous. Um, it tends to breed with the more THC, uh, more high THC plants. Um, it throws those out. And so I was like, okay, well, let's see what it does. And when I grew them, it was really cool. I got uh, out of the ones I grew, I found one that really smelled like burnt garlic, like kind of like what I consider to be pretty, like a pretty true skunk, but, um, you know, not a hundred percent skunk. It kind of smells like, like burnt garlic and, uh, really tasty and really potent, which was cool because it had the sexual stability of the grape soda skunk and it has the bigger buds and it grows easier and it grew faster than animal cookies which uh, I've noticed with these things like that, where when you inbreed them really to the point where they're like overly inbred, which I'd consider it like, I don't think I did the best job of inbreeding it. I could have selected it to have a little more size and vigor, you know? Um, uh, but I noticed that that becomes like true breeding within the population. But when you outcross them to things, um, it's, it's like, it's uh it's a recessive thing. So when you outcross it, if that's how deep chunk is too, when you outcross it, you can still get this crazy size and vigor. It's not going to dominate the hybrid in that way, which is kind of cool. Like I've made, I made a grape soda skunk cross PK and crossed it with cherry West and PK is a, a fairly tall ish plant, but not really. It's an OG. It's not like it has the insane vigor. But when I put them together, I wound up with these things that grew grape soda skunk size buds on like 16 foot plants. So it's kind of neat. Like it's a cool, they're cool tools like that. It doesn't, you look at it and you go, well, this is going to make everything small, but it, it, it not in an F1 as soon as you inbreed and then all of a sudden you're going to get the small ones back again, you know, but, um, but yeah, it's a, it's cool. But yeah, what to do with it is just, I just use it as a tool to breed stuff and I kind of like to put it out, but um, I don't know. I just did so much work on it that I I'm kind of hoarding it a little bit, you know, and I'm back and forth about 
what to do. I've given it to a couple people to make hybrids and they released a bunch of seeds and stuff, you know. That you could register as a variety probably. You could, if you, if you see it, it's, it's really cool. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it has enough, it has enough traits that, you know, it's, it's height, leaf shape, color, branching, uh, as far as I can tell, chemotype within a range, finishing time. Um, it, it, there's a, it's, it's really consistent for a lot of different things. So you could kind of pin it down to say, this is true breeding for a lot of things. And it's not like, oh, it's 90%. It's like, no, they're, they're all like this. The only variation is like a little bit in the, the degree of coloration and then a little bit in the height and vigor. And I'm talking like the difference between being waist high and belly button high, you know, like very, very consistent that way. And, there's always, uh, a, there's always a loud variation, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're not, you know, and that's good. There's a little, there's a little bit. And at this point I'll probably do some open pollinations with bigger populations to put those away so that I know any that's left is there before I just run it into the ground. Cause you know, I feel like I've run it into the ground to a degree, but the type that it was, was always the small side of the initial hybrid. So it wasn't like I turned this real great, huge plant into this little tiny thing. It just kind of, that was the, the stuff that was linked together was like, you know, purple stem, small. And it, I bred it for the smell and for the flavor and the smokability. It has the kind of weed that burns, right? You know, it's really super smokable. It's like really, um, enjoyable to smoke it so that was all i wanted and then it turned out the reason why i could smoke four or five joints of it was because it doesn't have very much thc in it but like i, I personally get i don't get like really high off of cbd but when i smoke like cbd weed with a lot of other stuff in it with a lot of all these terpenes and everything else that's in it I definitely smoke it and I feel good. I don't like just smoke it and nothing happens. I just don't ever get like a lot of my other weed, you smoke it and for about 10 or 15 minutes, you like think something might happen to you for a second. You're like, okay, all right, I'm really high. And then you're like, oh, I'm just stoned. It's no big fucking deal. But a little bit of panicky raciness and in, in a lot of the things I like. And that one you can just, you can give it to anybody and they're going to smoke it. And they'll definitely be high it, it'll still make like, you know, a, a, a joke funnier or food better or, you know, all that kind of stuff. It just doesn't, it, there's just not rushy at all, but it's good. Your, your first bag on a volcano has like, especially if the temperature is not very high, it's like almost all terpenes and no THC, not no THC, but very little. So and you get like really quite high on that first puff. Right. So. There's definitely something about taking in a big dose of terps like that. Yeah, for sure. Not, that, that gets a rip. Yeah. yeah. Cool plants. I was going to say when you were talking about the two sizes and the small ones and the, the slightly more vigorous ones, it's like the small ones are the ones that you want to be breeding together if you're going for true breeding, right? Like if you're really going towards like it's so it sounds to me like that's the way that I would go too. Those little run yeah. runty, but they're it's they're usually like that because they're more homozygous, right? They're already more true breeding. Yeah, right? and it was it it was a it was a thing where I had this really wild poly hybrid. So if, originally it has like I put like eleven things in it or something because I'd pick a male of whatever I had that was good and put it on the female that I liked, and I didn't do that with everything. But in this particular one, I just kept kind of going, oh well, this would be cool with that, and that'll be cool with this, and. I'll figure it all, sort it all out later. And I didn't think even after a point, I thought it would never work. But then I grew the F1 and I got this one plant that I really liked and I had a lot of the seeds. So I was like, all right, well, let's see if I can find this thing again. And the plant kind of had a distinct smell to the whole plant. It was the only one that had the real purple stems fed the same as the rest. It was a little more squat. So I popped a bunch more of the F1 and I got a couple of those plants and so I made seed with them and then when I made it there was still some of the the characteristics to the smells that were like here's that kind of floral thing I don't want here's a little of this here's a little of that and I kind of chased that stuff around and 
it kept co kind of coming back for a few generations and I couldn't quite pick right. And um, I wasn't trying like enough different pairings and I wasn't keeping any clones or anything. So it kind of, I kind of chased it around. And then um, after a while though, it was like, all right, well here these things are. So there might've been other things in there I could have done the same thing with and it might, it might've worked, but this was the one that, um, this was the one that happened to be what I put the, the, the time and energy to, but um, it, there is probably some truth to what you said, because when you see these plants, I know you after growing as many plants as you grew, if, if I gave you the seeds and you looked at them as soon as they got knee high, you'd go, oh, okay, I know this kind of stuff. This is, this is gonna, this is gonna, you know, this is gonna deep, deep this is gonna like do that big Afghani in bully thing, you know, <laughs> like it's, it does look like that. So you're, there's probably some, some, some truth to what you're saying with that, like squat, gnarly Afghan, it, it's, it's, um, you know, there might be some correlation with that type of plant and that type of behavior when you, when you mix it with everything, I would, I'd agree yeah. with that for well, sure. And I, really I don't have like any other, any other thing to go, no, actually I tried it with these big tall ones that smelled like mint and they, they, I got those consistent real quick too. So, um, I can't say whether or not it, it would have happened, but they, are that kind of plant where when you look at it, you go, oh yeah, if you cross this with something, you're probably gonna get all this. And, uh, you know, it does it to, to an extent. Plus when something's just so pure already, just the, the, the likelihood of the frequency of that coming out when you put it in is so much because it's a true type. So you're naturally gonna get so many of them too. But um, yeah, I don't know. They're, but they're, you know, they're neat to, to work with. And, grow and i give them to people who don't really want to grow weed but they want a little bit of like some cbd smoke and like you know well i just gave some to my mom to give to her friend that's older and didn't really want to grow but didn't misses having some plants and wanted some cbd weed and so they're like you know they're like good pets they're little you know cousin it in the corner it's just a little thing you know it's not gonna hurt anybody <laughs> <laughs> yeah no no <laughs> Yeah, your dog could probably eat it and it wouldn't matter, you know. Trevor was talking about dogs earlier. We, we've, we've put them through enough abuse today, drugging them and, well, with the yeah, injectable no, cannabis. <laughs> dogs on weed. I've seen it. And are you hearing us good now, Trevor? Are you back? Uh, yeah, is my audio okay? I had to yep. switch to my computer. Okay, you're good. Just wanted to, wanted to make sure so everybody can uh, participate in the conversation here. Um, Jackson, were you talking about, I because I cut out, were you talking about a relative of the Pina or so, a separate line? Uh, it's like this kind of like this uh, purple stemmed archetype in the mix, which is which we call perp. And I always thought it was some kind of an Afghani and it was really interesting to me because it has really small leaves and it has really thin branches and it has really narrow buds, but you can tell that like this is Afghani weed. And I always wondered like, where does this Afghani come from? And then talking to my buddy, he was like, oh no, that's the Burmese Indica. And I was like, but uh, uh, Indica in Southeast Asia, like what is what do you mean? You know? And he goes, Oh no, it's not an Indica from Burma. He goes, it's Burmese Indica, like Burmese cross Indica, like Thai Afghan, you know, like, like Hawaiian Mexican, you know? And I was like, Oh, cause I don't, you know, I'd heard it said and I was like, it just doesn't, it doesn't add up. I don't get it. And then I was like, well, that's stupid that I never considered that. So it's, it's, it's like, it's, you know, it's Afghani or, or Pakistani probably crossed with an old Burmese that showed up. And um, my buddy called it perp. Um, when it once it went to Barry, I called it Barry's. Uh, it originally came from another dude. We called it by his name. And um, and so originally, I knew that Pina and Grape Soda Skunk both had it because I had dirt crossed with perp crossed with marks, which were just these old things out the road from my buddy. And then. 
Um, later on, I took not Dirk Perp, but Dirk Big Bud, which I got from my same buddy. Um, and I ended up having that clone. And I think we cloned that in like 90 or 94 something like that we cloned it and it was this really good thing it smelled really good and it stayed around I thought it was gone and then around like 2004 I got it back and when I got it back from the dude I had this mail that I had got from our other buddy who's a friend of Sticky Fields out in his neck of the woods and I was like wow these are cool what are these these look familiar and he goes oh I got these from so and so and I go Oh, and then it, it's it's pure, and he goes, "No, I crossed it with so and so," and I go, "Oh, well, that means that essentially you have dirt cross perk because it's so and so cross so and so." And he goes, "Yeah, that's that'd be what it is." And I was like, "Okay," so he gave it to me, and he called it Ramrod Thirteen, but it was the same original lines that had already been pure, and he had had them, and he had bred them to be different, so, but it still had that purple stem perk Burmese indica thing in it, and so I was able to, after a while, I was able to piece it together. To the point where eventually I also found out that like in my line, when you get these purple stem plants that pop out of them, um, and they'll be a little more reddish in that usually, that, well, it turns out, oh, well, so-and-so is dating so-and-so, and they got it from her dad, and that was the partner of this guy and all this stuff. So it turned out that pina, grape soda skunk, and lime are all related through the same thing that we used to call perp, this Burmese indica, but they had come from different people and been bred in different directions. But what was cool was that they were so true to type originally that it wasn't like taking something that had tons of things in it and hadn't worked at all and then trying to make sense of that. It was these things that were already in there that wanted to pop out as themselves with this group of link traits. So, you know, really hard weed, really PM resistant, really sturdy, really bendy and nice. Um, and all these things that, that it, it, it traveled around in those three things with it. And it took me a long time to know that the line was part of what was in the pina and the grape soda skunk. The pina and the grape soda skunk I knew, but the, the line CBD. didn't yeah. until I realized, oh, Burmese indica, it's all from the same thing, you know? Yeah. No, and I've, I mean, I've done some work with the pina, and it, um, the CBD trait comes through. There's also that, I noticed with those, a lot of them have that, like, underleaf purpling, where it's not like necessarily, like, the top of the leaf is purple, but you flip it up under and look at the bottom side and there's like magenta or purple. And, um, but yeah, I, just having worked a little bit with the, the pina line and tried to trace back its lineage. And I remember the, the dirt perp when you released those seeds, you had a, a little bit of the lineage and a description and characteristic of the line. And I definitely found that to be true from the, the F4s that I ran, because I'm pretty sure it was the F4 you released back in like seven. And and, and at, at the F3, I used the mail that was the dirt, that I labeled as the dirt perp mail. And um, just because that was the look of it. And then those ones that I released were with the, the dirt perp style female. Um, I had taken those and bred those out of the F2. And then when everyone grew the F3s a bunch of times, then they were all that type. So I took them again at F3 and I paired them again. And so it was really easy to get them consistent because that's one of those plants that like these things are closely linked. So once you find it, it, it comes out a lot, you know? And it was the first, flavor that I ever grew. So it was super nostalgic for me. So like I wanted like Dirt Perp and Dirt Big. Those are like the ones that were like the first weed I ever had in a bag that I could like take like to the party when we we're eating mushrooms and be like, look, I grew this weed and we're like, whoa, this stuff's crazy. It's so sweet. You know, that kind of sickly, perfumey apple cider, pineapple. It's like yeah, really yeah. strong. And um, 
you know, it's, it's, I showed it to Tom Hill and he was like, oh, this is where all, this is where all Turk profiles go to die. Like meaning like he don't like it. Like it's just like, you know, Amsterdam A's like Jack Rack smell, you know? I mean, not the same, but the same deal. And, and I couldn't like argue it because I'm like, yeah, if you throw two buds of that in a pound, it's all going to be dirt perp now, you know, like it all smells like pina. Mm -hmm. So, but I like it. It's what I cut my teeth on, you know? And you cross it to anything. And it's like, we made, I took the pina F4 and crossed it with uh, Indian guys, 88 G13 hash plant, just because they were two relatively worked lines, wanted to see that pairing. So Super more pina. Yeah, yeah. I mean, pina, everything. Like, it, pina just stomped on. Yeah. There is almost no HP. Like, there's some structure components, be, be, but the terps is yeah. all pina. And then we crossed that, and we, like, selected a male that was specifically on the pina side of things. And, um, and by we, I mean, like, my homie, myself, and a crew of dudes who were all, like, standing around being like which is the one that is the most pineapple and sure enough the dudes selected and there was like a group of like six dudes who were like that one and one dude was like this other one and then once he realized everybody voted for that one he was like yeah that one <laughs> but um i fucking i remember hitting all sorts of random ass hype shit donnie burger um Lots of things that are like overpowering terps, GMO sort of terps that usually stomp on whatever they're crossed to. And it was like the battle royale of garlic, pineapple, marigold, cider, all these like just wild, absolutely wild. And so, yeah, uh, like when you, I saw you mention that before about the pinion, I'm like, yeah, it just stomps whatever it hits, it's going to stomp on it turf-wise. I definitely heard that as well. I, I grew out a couple of the Pina F4s, but I didn't uh, didn't pollinate anything. Grew them out, enjoyed them, loved them. Um, but uh, Cam, he's another host on the show. He uh, had the did some crosses with the Pina F4, and that was his advice to me. He's like, man, it comes through and everything, which he was stoked about. <laughs> yeah, it's cool if you really like it. So the one that I that I, the, that I liked it with was um, I crossed it with the Cherry Limeade, which is super, super high in, in, in terpenes. And so when I did that, it was able to be a new thing that was this real like kind of fruit punch. Um, and those were just really good and really medicinal because the cherry limeade is really good for like nerve pain and pain. And the pina is, is got all the CBD in it. And um, so those ones came out really, really cool. And I liked those a lot. And because I used, what did I use? I used an F. I think it, at that point it was still the same. I used the F3 Pina, but it was a it was really consistent F3s. And then I used a F5 Cherry Limeade. And so it behaved like an actual F1. So when you look at them, if you have 20 of them, there's one with smaller buds and the rest of them look like you planted a clone. And the one with smaller buds, you go, eh, I probably just like overwatered it or something. You know, like because it's still the same weed, but maybe you'll get maybe, you know, a little bit more pointy of a flower or something, slight difference, but very much of what you would expect from an F1 made with real stock. So it was, those ones were really cool. And so they were right in the middle and, you know, like mold, basically mold proof, mildew proof, like really, really cool. The only thing that likes them is caterpillars because caterpillars like sweet weed for some reason, but, um, but yeah, but those came out really cool. But generally, it's uh, it's it's one of those ones that's like just keep it pure, you know. It's the same as like a lot of things that are heavy on the terpenoline. I if I like them, I like to keep them pure because I know when I make the hybrids, it's going to be more a matter of like the the pina itself was uh, the year I had the dirt big bud crossed with the ramrod, which was the which was the other like remix of dirt perp 
which is what's in the pina. I took those and I put them on this plant that I had that was supposed to be Urkel crossed with something, but it, it wasn't. And after um, years of looking at different plants and breeding, like breeding like Blue Dream and F2ing those and seeing what's in there and seeing a lot of people's super silver haze, I'm like, I think it was probably a super silver haze plant. And it came from these dudes in Willets who pretty much grew all haze and white widow back then. So, um, you know, who knows? Could have been white widow haze for all I know. But I, I it's, and anytime somebody shows me, like my buddy Kingston had some um, super silver haze males and he's like, look at these. And I'm all, hey, look at these. Cause there's the pina that I bred to the green side that's high THC, smells more herbal, reminds me of rosemary and, like it, everything about like the super silver haze lines that I've seen, it, it's like, that seems like what it is. And it just made sense coming from the guys. So I don't know. But when I crossed those together, it made the Pina be what it is now, where it has a little bit better um, yield. And um, it's a little, it's a little easier in a lot of different ways. And it has different branchiness and you get more of like the extra narrow leaf ones that I like. And so like in that case, it was a cool cross that I did just kind of randomly and tried them because I thought maybe they'd be cool. And I liked that mom a lot, but, um, but anytime you have things to circle back, like if it's a terpenaline dominant thing and you know, it's really gonna just come in and take over, you got to know that you're going to get something out of it beyond a new flavor. Because the flavor, the new flavor, you might get it, but you might just wind up with a bunch of pina or a bunch of, you know, train wrecky, you know, those certain, those certain ones that, that, um, that bully it. So like, if you want to make an improved train wreck, it's probably not going to, you're not going to improve a whole lot on the nose because you're probably going to get a lot of train wreck nose. You're going to want to like, improve on maybe make the high more soaring or make the you know whatever you're looking to improve it's you're you're gonna have a harder target if you try to improve things that have a super you know pina smell or or uh the or things like that and i know that you guys have you guys have seen that with um with stuff but too you know probably a lot of people might not know that and might spend three or four years and go god damn it this is what now I just have all the same thing again, you know, so. Yeah, there do seem to be those um, certain turf profiles that just dominate everything. And, you know, if it's what you're looking for, it's great. But if you don't know that that's what you're getting, it's and that it's just going to crush whatever you cross it to. Um, that can be a bummer. But um, yeah, I, I I was stoked on uh, the way that the Pina Terps crossed in with things. And um, yeah. Well, I, I know it's kind of the, the beginning of the outdoor season for everybody. And Ryan, I don't know what you're planting this year, but you know, maybe maybe we could kind of go around and see what people are putting in into the ground this year and why. Uh, are, are you outdoor, Ryan, or is everything uh, controlled indoors? Are you there? You're on mute. Am I on mute? Nope. Okay. There we go. There we go. <laughs> um, I'm putting out some, uh, a couple of, a hybrid of a couple of self lines. I've got a cookie self line and a line I call the high test OG. That's like really, well, it's high testing OG nose, like <laughs> kind of that classic gold class. Yeah, creative with the name there. Yeah, well, I mean, it's what it is, right? So, <laughs> right. Um, and OG. And so I had self them both to uh, to chase a couple of traits, little old in one of them. And anyway, I put those back together, so I was screening a few of those. I'm cool. also doing them at an indoor facility in BC, so I'm uh, just kind of trying to up the nut ends a bit, see if I can find anything different. So, so still working, working with your own stuff, really kind of refining and hunting that. I'm trying to put on good examples of things in the Canadian market. The Canadian market is a, it's a bit of a gong show, and uh, gong show. So, yeah, I'm just trying to put on 
some unique things for you know for one cultivator out on the west coast so right well you know it's 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 funny how the market really kind of drives what people grow so to you know have you doing something that you're a little bit more passionate about but you still feel as a solid product is a great thing too yeah this is an old friend who understands the seed business and understands the importance of having something different for your brand than just trying to grow the same thing as everybody else yeah, yeah. So. necessary evil but uh that's what distinguishes people from the other so yeah you got to have an identity somewhere yeah well you got the pleasing of the crowds yeah well i guess in certain markets like california is big enough that you can you know i guess there's a f room for a few huge operators but the smaller operators certainly can't grow the same thing as those guys are Unless they're really boutiquing it, right? I guess they can if they're boutiquing it, but it's got to stand out and be good flower. There's a lot of it's a tough market in California. <laughs> it's really the cream of the cream, right? Well, that's that's what I hear. But uh, you know, Jackson, you've been you've been living that for a long time uh, up there. So the you know the competition, or I, I would not say the competition, but maybe the standards. I'm you know your standards are pretty high, so. Not just anything gets in the ground there, I'd imagine. What's what's going in this year? I mean, like uh, the way I've I've started to see it is like if you if you want to have something, um, like you if you just want to jump in and do something that you know will work, then you need like those commodity flavors. You know what I mean? Like everybody knows, like the term over the last couple of years to became purple gas. You got to have biscotti or any of those like basic, like cookie type things, you know? Um, but at the same time, I know people who grow things that are really special and they only grow a little bit of it and they know people who want it. And those people actually get a lot of money for weed that nobody thinks anybody's getting, but these guys get it. And then if you grow these other things, it's like, yeah, it, it's plug and play, but you're going to get that commodity price. Like, yeah, you can sell that purple gas, but at the same time, there's people who want real gas weed that's like straight gnarly shit. And they're not going to, it, it's not going to, the, the two markets aren't competing with each other at all. So while it's washed out and everybody has this shiny purple weed, and they have a thousand pounds of it and they can sell it all fast for cheap. You know, there's these other guys who maybe they only, they're running like a six or an eight lighter and they're only pulling a little bit of weed and they might hold on to it for a little longer, but the people who do want it, it's going to trickle out to them and they're going to pay a lot of money for it because they can't go get it from anybody else. Cause people just don't have it, you know? So, um, there's a divide there and um most weed sucks like no matter where you go most weed is not good you know but you can like go on vacation somewhere where it's really hard to find weed and people will be like oh i can get you an ounce of weed for 500 dollars," and you look at it and it's garbage or they maybe can get you a pound for 500 dollars, and you look at it and it's garbage or a pound for a hundred dollars and it's just trash, you know, like brickweed, like Colombian brickweed when you're in Costa Rica or whatever. A um, hundred bucks for a quarter pound is like fairly common if you know somebody, you know, but there's almost no weed in there. And then you'll meet one guy <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I have I have this right here. It's going to cost three fifty an ounce. But you look at it and you're like, this is like the best weed you could get anywhere. It's just the same. It's like, oh, you know, like, oh, California weed or Oregon weed or, uh, you know, whatever, like, um, you know, wherever you're talking about. Everybody, people who are in a little bubble, they're like, you know, there's the people who are like, oh, California doesn't have the gas like like New York. And then if you go to New York, you'd be like, I can't find shit. The weed all sucks here, you know? And then people go to California and they're like, the weed all sucks here. You go to Costa Rica, you go to Jamaica like everywhere you go, but there's always these little pockets of people who have the best weed. And when it's really that good, as long as they know enough people, then they, they have like a special little market for, for that kind of stuff, you know, 
but people have to be social or they have to be really tied in with like certain certain groups and know what they're doing so it's like huge divides whereas if you just grow what you know is really popular and go okay we're all growing runts or we're all growing you know whatever it, whatever the flavor is at the at the moment then you know that when everyone runs out of their runts they're going to show up and they're going to buy they're going to buy your runts you know so there's the, there's the little boutique and then there's the and then two like 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 uh ryan said it's like um if you if you also you know are a really good grower and you do have the eight lighter and you're growing the thing that's a commodity weed it can also be separated it doesn't necessarily just because you're growing the clone that is what everybody has there's also a grade of that clone that nobody has and if you can consistently produce that and have that on hand then you know then you you could be known for that too so it, it's really a, a, like there's not the only way that there's a one size fits all is if you are going to pump into the commodity market of everybody wants units of this hot flavor of the day. And then, you know, then that, that that's happening. But that whole part of it in California completely hit a wall and it crashed out. And that pretty much put um I know I, you could say half the operators, three quarters, it might be closer to 85 or 95% of all the people who grow a lot of weed. They're, when you'd want to grow a million pounds, you're over or even you know a couple thousand pounds, your overhead is so much that as soon as the numbers stop crunching, everything, it, 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 it's ir, it, you cannot get it back on track, you know? Um, so that seems to be what's happened a lot is that um, right now people are seeing um, a little bounce back because when everybody goes to find weed, everyone's like, hey, everybody has weed. It's flooded. The market's flooded. It's flooded. And you go, yeah, do you have this, though, this many of these that look like this? And people are like, oh, let me look. And then it's like, oh, but we have this. And they're like, that's not that. And so they keep looking and they keep looking. And by the time they find somebody who has it, everybody knows they can't find it. And these guys have it and they're like, okay. So it's starting to kind of regulate a little bit because the real guys who were the big monsters who could really do it big, they could do it big because there was this huge return. But when it costs you a million dollars a year to operate and you were making $2 million, you're like, whoa, a million dollars in profit. But when it costs you a million dollars to operate and all of a sudden you're making $150,000, guess what? You're done. It's over. And you can't just go pull $2 million out of your ass again next year and come back and flood the market. So right now everybody's sweating like, oh, when the depths come in, it's all going to, then it's going to crash back again. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't know that there's that many people who could afford to keep their places and do it to bring back the flood that existed before because it was a lot, there was a lot of people doing a lot of things. And then even in the real, in the, in the trackable legal market, they said, I think it was Santa Barbara County. I could be wrong, but I think they, it was 160 acres of permits closed this year, just gone. They don't have them anymore. And that's one County. And I didn't even think of that one as the big one. Maybe it was really big, but um, you know, I, I would expect to hear more from other places being, bigger and and so what happened there like when you see you know where there's one there's more usually so um you know i don't know it's it's all kind of uh kind of going weird like that but i think still you want to you want to be able to have the craziest version of the craziest genetic possible so if you can have the weed that people love the most and then grow it better and dry it better and handle it better than everyone else. It's really apparent when you look at stuff that hasn't been handled, it hasn't been mm -hmm. messed up. It was yep. grown really well. It was harvested at the right time. It was, it was, uh, you know, dried just perfectly. It was stored just perfectly. Then it's, you know, there, there's a real big difference when you see really, really good weed, you almost can't believe it exists. And that now <laughs> is what people expect. But you right. Oh, is that my internet? Nope. Nope. Okay. Uh oh. 
That's cut now. I, that offers me encouragement. What he's saying there, though, it kind of sounds like the rise of craft again, which is where I fit in. You know, I always think in terms of indoors. So going from like 200 lights back to 20 um, and really just perfecting something. One thing that I think maybe we've lost track of uh, in, in the market today is, you know, we grow a lot of everything instead of specializing one strain whereas people who are busting out houses before it's like you grew one or two strains and you knew how to grow it well so and that's i was just saying uh jackson that it, it that's encouragement because it sounds like craft may have the rise to get oh dang he fell out um but it's well. true i mean the market has been disrupted by these big corps that were not really sustainable and they were running on investor investor money Right when reality kicked in, it, it, they they screwed the market for themselves because they overproduced more than the market could sustain between them all, but certainly mar more than the market could sustain plus all the craft guys, right? And it wiped out a bunch of craft guys, unfortunately. But I think that there is a wave also that you know those big corporation money guys were able to get licenses more easily than the craft guys, and I think a lot of the craft yeah, guys right. are coming in later. It's going to be like the latest surgeons in Canada. They've been calling them this one of the CEOs of the big multi billion dollar company called them ankle biters. But I mean, what a dick. really, what's going on is they're stealing his lunch, yeah. right? Like every quarter, they're taking more of his business and he's like losing more year over year, right? Quarter over quarter. So it's exactly what you said. You know, the market has matured to a point where if you're paying legal prices and taxes and all that stuff in, you better be getting the Uber craft quality. Right. And, uh, yeah, I think craft is back. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a good thing. That was, that's what I was taking away from what you were saying there. Uh, Jackson is that's, it's awesome that it sounds like the small person can actually kind of start coming back again, provided you're yeah. doing something immaculately you know not just anybody yeah there's there's a big secret to how to do it and I, that was what i told you when it cut out but now i i can't remember what it was so, <laughs> so the secret to success has been lost oh uh, we'll never know but yeah i do think there's a lot to be said for small efficient operations particularly in an economic downturn like a lot of these corporations that got highly capitalized and got investment capital prior to the economic slowdown and downturn and inflation and all this shit, like, remember, stupid money was flying around. GameStop, NFTs, like, dumb fucking money existed partially because of the crypto explosion. And there was, and, you know, a whole bunch of other factors. But point is, Lots of dumb money got thrown into the system and those people didn't necessarily, they expanded super fast. They were looking at recession, COVID, quarantine level consumption and like California's consumption rate has totally changed post COVID quarantine people's, you know, all these different factors have made it so that quality and efficiency are really making a comeback and are the key to survivability in the California regulated market. And so big ups to all, all the ankle biters, as it were. And it's it's cool. It's it's um it's not just a weed thing. It's like when there was all of a sudden everybody's like, eggs, eggs are, there's a million memes. Like I can't afford eggs anymore. You know, I'm like, well, I mean, if you have chickens or, you know, somebody who has chickens or if these farms were a little bit smaller and there was more of them scattered around, then you have a sustainable um, model, but you can't have a sustainable model that is these huge monster things because like, you know, to use a dumb, a dumb one here, it's like all your eggs in one basket, right? So like, as soon as something goes wrong. Uh oh, if we're losing another secret right now, I'm going to be pissed. Well, the secret is, is that, that you got to regulate eggs, right? And they all have to pass through a central warehouse with 30% taxation. 
Did we just miss the secret to egg supply chain management? <laughs> so, yeah, that was a good one. And um, yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely all there and it was really easy to solve it all. Uh, pretty much the whole economy in general <laughs> and the economic downturn and the crash. And also uh, I explained in detail the way to make NFTs profitable again and also uh, a new coin that's better than Bitcoin that's going to blow up a lot faster. So if you just go back and um, and rewatch what I said, I can't uh, remember, but it was it was all there. Digicoin, Digicoin. No. It was a lot to consume. It was. All right. We we got to keep fighting these those technical difficulties. We miss all the good stuff. There was nothing there, man. I was just saying that you you know if you, if you get everything too big and concentrated in different areas, then all of a sudden it's not sustainable anymore. You know, like what realistically the whole thing is like it'd be better if if we all smoked a lot of weed. And I really want to grow the, the couple things that I'm really good at growing, but I really want to have different weeds. And so I can basically buy your weed and you buy my weed and it all works in a big circle and that's a healthy economy. And that's just using weed as an example because maybe you don't want to grow weed, but maybe somebody makes shoes or somebody makes this product or that product. But everything's been outsourced to these big things and that's the that's at the heart of, of the issues. and it become those things become the most profitable and the most convenient. So the people who are creating them are, are great getting all the profits and the people who are consuming them are great getting, you know, this reliable source of something that's so convenient and so cheap. But as soon as it breaks down a tiny bit, you're like, okay, we're completely unsustainable. Now you can't even get right. You couldn't get toilet paper. You couldn't get any of these things that were these little things that you wanted to get. And I was like, I'm sorry, we don't have it. You've got empty store shelves. And a lot of the things you're going to buy, it's like, well, if you really think about it, you're like, damn, like, okay, we can't get, you can't get beef right now, or you can't get milk or you can't get eggs. It's like, these are not magical things. These aren't circuit boards that like you have to have any kind of, it's like pretty simple stuff, you know, like the people who produce a lot of things, don't have the craziest skill set. They just do a lot of work, but it all gets outsourced for convenience. And then, you know, you're, you're relying on this. That's what's happened with weed a lot. People all the time are like, I want really, really good weed and I can't find it. And I'm like, uh, you know, if you grow your own weed, just the fact that you dried it at your house and you grew it right there and it never really got packaged and processed and handled. And you'd be surprised that your own homegrown weed that's not really that great is still heads above what you can go buy in a store in most cases and you can grow it for really cheap like when you grow your own weed like i give people it's been i don't know 20 years i've been giving people huge sacks of weed all the time and it's never stopped and it's never slowed down <laughs> and i never felt it it wasn't like oh right God and giving this guy that ounce and a half it's like dude i grew it like it wasn't a very big deal it's the same with eggs you want a dozen eggs but all of a sudden people are memeing you know the million dollar egg carton so um you know if, if you can what you can do yourself in and even in an area it doesn't have to be you but you know someone in the area produces things and um That'd be nice if we could have like more like direct sales, farm stand type weed stuff, like distribution's you know. an issue. Yeah. Take a sack and, and take a sack and put a and put a twenty in the in the locked cash box out there, you know? And I'll come out and put more weed in the fridge out there, run it at the little bus stop setup out there, and then come out and unlock the box and get the money and you know, everybody'd have killer weed, but it's not like that. It's like it's gotta <laughs> go to this guy, it's gotta go to that guy and the whole thing sucks, you know? Yeah, I'm in Washington where you can't even vertically integrate. But that's funny because my wife literally did stuff money in a box and grab some eggs for us today. <laughs> We've got a few farms around us. I'm, I'm fairly rural, so we're able to still do that. But Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I you can't do it everywhere. Up and not the weed. <laughs> Say it again? I love how the money is locked up and not the weed. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's just that um, you know, that's generally how you like a little farm stand, you know, everybody, people are more likely to come and steal the money and instead of your, 
you know, whatever, whatever your product is that's there. Like money is just a little, as they say, keeping honest people honest with the little lock, you know, like I'm sure somebody well, can break your box too. But. I think cannabis should be so plentiful that it is worthless and it's only worth, the only worth to it is that it is of that stellar next level quality special in some way. For it's sure. And factor. I, yeah. I don't think there's a problem with people being able to get um, people being able to get weed where you can buy a pound of weed for eight or ten dollars or whatever, depending on what the weed is. And then you could have some weed that it costs a dollar an ounce and it's great for what ails you. And then if you want the fancy weed that's all about flavor and flash and rarity and all that and it costs ten thousand dollars an ounce you know but like you need medicine that was always the funny thing was people saying i need the medicine you know and i'd be like oh like but you've never even tried this you have no idea if it's any good for what what's going on with you you know like it's it's one of those funny funny things but it's but but i i do believe that weed is easy enough to grow that everybody should be able to go buy um you know, people should, they shouldn't even have to buy it. I mean, if like, as, as somebody who runs a nursery, I have to wind up getting composting enough weed that if they would just make it easy for me to show up at the little shows or the clubs, I would go to every dispensary in the area and be like, here, this is the free box and everybody can just come grab weed. I don't care. I'm going to have to throw it away, but I can't do it legally. And I don't have time to drive around and hand out weed to everybody because I'm busy winnowing seeds and shit, you know? So the, uh, they don't it, want you to give away. They want the tax money. So they certainly don't want to make it easier for you to give away weed. Yeah. Which is, is crazy because it's a, it's a weird kind of, of greediness. And it's like, here's something that we have that could be, better than all the way everything else works where it's like they don't see the glitch in the way that everything works with the, um, the way we do everything. It's like, yeah, maybe I don't want to make this and I don't want to make that. So we outsource it and it, these conglomerates own it and all that. But here's something that we did have and that people could grow and give to everybody. And it is a medicine and it can help people like you can't leave one thing alone. You got to just completely have your hands in every pie and fuck everybody with everything. It's just like, okay, all right. But people were, people were doing really good. Our economy here is completely shot right now. Like we have a store that during 215 went from being a little old rundown store that was decent and it was there for 50 years or whatever. And then it looked like a real store, really nice, like a small, you know, a quarter size Safeway or something really nice store. I'm sure it costs millions of dollars to build. If you go in there right now, you go into the Ace Hardware section, it's 75% off. They're clearing it all out. They don't want to sell it anymore. You go down the aisles and they're probably 20% full. And at certain points, you can't get a single produce item. You can't get anything. And it did used to be this beautiful thing. It made a lot of money, but it's only a symptom of, of what's happened. There's no... Um, oh there's just no money anymore you know and there was money and it, it's like that in a lot of communities like definitely affecting a, a big percentage of stuff you know people don't have the extra money to give to any of the programs that are that are cool you know there used to be a lot of um good stuff it was a huge change from from the the 90s and the 80s uh, in, in coming into recent years and then it took about a few years and now it's like there's going to be in my town where there was thriving businesses there probably will be um pretty soon there'll be a little store and a gas station that'll, that'll be it and that's going to happen to i can think of at least a dozen towns just right here real that'll happen really quick you know it's a trip has yeah. there been much outside investment in those areas or is it just people can't survive they leave i mean what who wants to go invest in detroit right like that was what i was yeah the auto industry it, when they left well, yeah. yeah when you have an when you have an industry that all of a sudden collapses on itself and I, and not to say that it's because it, there's there's a lot more potential for it to bounce back and it is a really pretty area and you know there's the redwoods and there's all that stuff that brings a certain amount of tourist money and people want to come here for other reasons um and it's nicer weather and it's, it's beautiful, you know, 
but as far as it being able to like you know like could you move you could move, if you moved here and opened s something there just isn't there isn't any money and i i for years i've had a feeling that the economy in these places is really injecting a lot of money into the working economy of california i wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of businesses throughout california even when where they thought there wasn't very much weed money where they're going huh this is interesting why is the economy so bad it must be because of politics and it must be because of this and that it's like well i mean you maybe did remove probably a few billion dollars a year Do I remember being in the grocery store in your town and they had turkey bags on the end caps of the aisles during harvest season. Yeah. Right. And, and Fisker scissors in the lineup was like the last that was in the grocery, you know, last thing that you grab before the checkout line. I mean, it was very, very clear that that economy ran on weed. Like I was blown away the first yeah. time I was there. So, yeah, the, you know, yeah. the changes are, are, are shocking really like on, how much money they've taken out of there on that note i showed up in humboldt on like you know garberville in september of 97 and um you know it's harvest season essentially right like the time period we were there <coughs> it was packed it was just like the the redwood market or redway market i mean um banging just like seemed like one of the most populated like a, an urban center sort of thing fucking you know like ryan just described turkey bags fiskers everything on the end caps literally like old grandma uh checkout people being like oh no you want that product not this product if you grab the wrong scissors like everybody knew it was a booming economy even yeah. all the way back as far as 97 and then I went up there, I think like a year or two ago, and it was, I was in Garberville. The parking lot was desolate. Inside the Garberville market was completely dead. There was nobody there. And I just like looked around town and it, it was shocking as somebody who showed up at a time when like 97 things weren't as wild as they were like 2015 or 16 or 17. And it's it's just wild how much it's impacted particularly there because they had a bigger economy but like we've got the same thing down here in calaveras where mountain ranch senders market used to be popping and just insane and it used to take an hour to get a sandwich at this like deli bar or a counter and uh now it's just like you're lucky to run into people <clears throat> I live in a small town too, <clears throat> and it's it's kind of one of those things where, uh, um, you know, a lot of businesses will open, but as a local, you're like, well, we'll see if it lasts through the winter, right. because there's absolutely nobody here. It's it's the tourists that come, which I guess we have tourists, whereas up there doesn't really have tourists uh, as much. Is that changing? Is there weed farm tourism? There's a little bit, I mean, but there's very few that are still actually like operational, you know? I know uh, Turp Mansion is like a really, really skilled grower. And I saw that he's starting, he, he gives tours. He's been doing it for a couple of years, I guess. And he's just one of those people who keeps an immaculate space and has like super, you know, he's very sophisticated and he's very OCD and very technical and skilled and, you know, so he can do it, but the thing is, is the population's not made up of people like that. So it it's a you know it, you don't get a threat. You get a thriving economy from the bottom up. So you want everybody to have a little thing to do, regardless of what it is. And there's very few places where it's ever been possible for that to exist, and it did exist. And all they really had to do was remove the penalties of, of you know, incarceration, basically. Like, yep. hey, you won't go to prison, but it's still not legal. You can't sell it in a store. If you sell tainted weed, you're still going to get the same thing you would get for selling anything else tainted. 
There's not going to be any crime related specifically to cannabis. But if you do, and I've said this lots of times before, but it's like the crimes that you could have, it's like, hey, if you do something and it's really bad and it's related to weed, then there must be some crime that doesn't, it, the weed doesn't matter, right? There must have already been a crime. If you really are worried about law and order, then just worry about anything related to it, like drug related violence. Well, any related violence is a crime. So take the, take the time that you're taking to send all these mercenaries out here to go shoot people's dogs and have them try to look at, find the people who do the violent crimes because a very small percentage of people who commit all the robberies. In this area, everybody gets ripped off all the time by the same little family that they constantly let out of jail all the time. They're in and out and in and out. And everyone knows who they are. And these are the guys who steal everybody's shit, you know? <laughs> and in the meantime, you know, you look at you look and you're like, oh, well, they just raided these guys for this. And you're like, yeah, but for what? They had a bunch of turkey bags full of weed and some money and then oh this is this big rage you're like so was the weed really that hazardous and you know you just look at the focus and you're like guys it's just such a like fundamentally broken mentality that 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 you know just runs through everything where you're like this is really kind of a simple thing just let people do what they're doing that's harmless and then try to focus on the stuff that you know is harmful but instead they want all the money like oh, there's tax money we're going to get all this money the government's going to get all this money i'm like you guys are already getting your sales tax you guys are already getting whatever it is eight percent off of every dollar that changes hands in california that comes from weed so they were probably already getting eight percent of like 30 billion dollars but that's not enough and now they're they're not probably going to wind up getting shit at a certain point and then uh, you know it's like the whole thing is weird it's just a weird it's just a weird thing of, of how you know things are things are like uh set up and how it's viewed by by the people that are making the system happen but i don't know i ran about it all day but well, has civil forfeiture laws changed there? And I don't know, Trevor, maybe you know the answer to this one, but um, where they can't actually confiscate or like, oh, hey, look, you've got a nice boat. You got a pot plant. Guess what we're doing tomorrow, boys? We're getting a boat. Um, civil forfeiture where they can basically just take your money and then that's that's what they do. Really? Um, like... That shit still happens. There's been issues about that on the federal level, but you know, uh, we know people who have had their stuff seized. You know, Jackson uh, Bam had his stuff taken by the Santa Cruz cops. He he was able to fight it and get his stuff back. But um, there's, they'll still just take your shit. Like that's just like common mo practice of the cops: shoot the dog, take the shit. Like. They're, it's what they do. And so there's, I don't think, things are supposed to have changed and turned everything into a civil. Like, none of that shit should have been criminal with those people. Like, that raid that just happened up in Trinity, all of that should have been dealt with through civil administrative processes. Um, and that's typically how it's done now, is, like, code enforcement is really the the beast now like people get letters from code enforcement and that's really how they like they've maximized fines they've done all these things to make it so that they can shut down and this is where they fucked up if they had just taken the system that you know 215 and what just kind of organically emerged out of people just taking a few liberties here and there and going out and doing a thing and being like well fuck I'm going to grow in full sun. Okay, I grew that many. I'm going to grow this many. And, like, some case law developing around it and people just expanding the, like, range of freedoms and possibilities that were allowed through the dispensary system and all that. And if that had just transitioned, the organically formed thing that supported thousands and thousands of small producers and operations across the state, because we're talking about like 15,000 
estimated grows up in Humboldt prior to uh, regulations or, you know, Prop 64 getting implemented in 2018 to now where they're estimating, I think it's 1,500 maximum grows in like total. And that's including all the permitted ones and the like a few remaining, uh, you know, unregulated whatever. And so, and you like magnify that across the state, you know, it's Calaveras, Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, everywhere that there was a, a growing community and a culture that was doing this thing under 215 in the medical system, you know, most of them have been impacted, shut down, and a few places still have regulations. Most have adopted bans across, like, you know, for cultivation and all sorts of activities. And, like, I think 60 or 70 percent of the counties or jurisdictions in the state. And so in the few places that were actually able to operate, most places have put land use restrictions that are made so that you can't actually grow where we traditionally went and grew. And so now you have to move to agricultural land. Agricultural land in California is kind of worth a lot. And so, you know, it's just, it's, it, we had a really good system and it's been fucked. Like, and I don't think there's any, Calaveras County did a study in 2016, 17 about our cannabis industry and it was $340 million. And we paid $13 million in taxes that next year like calaveras was a, a blip a tiny nothing compared to humble or these other places so the fact that we were already producing 340 million dollars based on a economic impact report study but like and that it tangibly produced 13 million dollars in uh, tax revenue for our community is mind-boggling considering what's now you know like 1.3 million in tax revenues or something at best yeah, and then pull out another 8% on sales tax and then figure in the property tax in that jurisdiction as well, which is being paid, which won't be paid because people's land gets foreclosed on. You look at the amount of money that actually is generated by a healthy bottom-up economy and you go, okay, there's all these places where all this money is being injected into the economy and it stops when everything gets a wrench thrown in it. And it's crazy because you because you it's just a matter of it's like a weird it's like a weird thing of like lords and peasants you know it's like okay well we want our money from it's like well isn't it enough that people are already having uh, healthy communities that are actually circulating a lot of currency to where everything is working way better than it ever was before this. But it's not. It's like no, that you have to you have to kick in your your money towards this in these specific taxes that are actually not. You know, it's like they they basically could have just said, "Hey, everybody, it's now it's it's uh, it's you can pay you can pay income tax and say that it's agricultural income tax on your weed." And if you get busted, you're not going to get incarcerated. If you grow this much weed and you have anything that you're doing wrong, what you do wrong, that'll be a crime. And there'll be a fine for doing this. They could have like decriminalized it on a small level and be like, hey, if you got if you got under 10 pounds, whatever, you're good. If you have over 100 pounds, it's going to be a $5,000 fine. A lot of people would have been like, damn, okay, this is not for me because I don't I'm not in it like that. And the people who were would have been able to just keep going and doing all their stuff. And it could have been done really simply. And like you said, you could have left everything in place. These little weed clubs, the little weed things, you know, our county tried to make it like, okay, everybody can grow 25 plants. And then they said, everybody can grow 99 plants, but you got to pay for these tags for your plants to grow them. And people were like, okay with that. And that was still a little bit like, extortion you know what i mean like hey your crop we'll make sure your crop doesn't get cut down if you give us some money you know like we'll make sure your bar doesn't burn down you know it's like a protection racket really but now it's still kind of a protection racket because it's not really legal and you see how it goes like the people who who got their dog shot in trinity it wasn't that they weren't permitting it was that the county 
didn't do the work to let them get the county permit, but they have the state permit. So they shouldn't really, like you said, they shouldn't have been raided. They should have showed up and been like, hey, you guys got to cease and desist. You have to stop because you don't have the right permits. They weren't outlaws or criminals. They were just not, everything wasn't right. Like they weren't, they didn't have the potential to be able to make everything work. So, um, you know, I don't know. The whole thing is just like super tainted and, and fucked up for no no good reason, but you know, um, it, it's just, it's just weird. Yeah. Well, real, real quick, uh, we take a break in action. I think Ryan, uh, is on the East coast pushing 1 AM over there midweek. He's, he's, he's going to bounce out for the evening. Uh, you're on mute right now though, Ryan, but, uh, any, any last words or where, uh, you know, things nothing, you think people should nothing know? Nothing relevant. Just wanted to say good night. Cheers, right. Jackson. Nice meeting you. And yeah, we'll see man. you other gentlemen soon. Cool. Have nice a good conversation. Idea. Have a good one. Yeah. Cheers. Have Thank a good you, night. Ryan. Cheers. Great to talk with you, man. You too. You know, you're absolutely right. I don't think, you know, and, and my experience in Washington here is they did not get input from the right people as far as how things should go or could go or will play out um, the, to where it damaged local economies. Um, it was fairly misguided in this state and it sounds like it missed the mark there because there's a lot of people now who are faced with tougher decisions yeah i mean it was it's like imagine if you imagine like if you like walk into a place where somebody's already doing a job you know what i mean and you're like oh maybe these guys should be like wearing hard hat right you're like okay cool well let's make sure that like everybody gets a hard hat but instead you come in and you're like, oh, well, you know, you're all using the wrong everything. So let's give you all new shit and all the new shit that they give you sucks. And that's basically what they did. They took something that was already a functional thing happening. Everybody kind of knew what was going on. It all worked. You could tell it worked pretty good because there was a lot of symptoms of success, right? But then they just completely... They said, oh, no, we, we, uh, we're just going to make it like this. And it's like, well, you don't really get a different effect. There's not, you don't gain any benefit from like anybody who know anybody who did, like I don't put weed in stores and shit, but if I did, and I was one of these assholes that grows shitty weed full of mold and, and pesticides and all the things that they think like, oh, well, regulation will protect people. You know how easy you could game the system? And be like, no, I'm just going to slide my garbage in here and I'm going to test. I'll just go get some weed that I know is 100% clean from somebody and I'll give them this and tell them to test that. You know, like it, the whole thing, there's no there's no added safety for anybody. It's that it, the only thing that's better. Everybody goes, well, this is good because it let people out of jail and now people don't get busted. And I go, cool, but couldn't that have just been the thing? Like, name the things that we gained in real life and just do that shit and get rid of the rest of this shit because it doesn't make any sense you know it's it's crazy and it, and and there should have never been you shouldn't be able to have acres and acres and acres and acres of weed it's stupid right. and the, the 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 way those the way those things are it's like it, it it's inherently toxic to the flow of the system it's like it has the way it was working. You could tell it worked because it worked, you know, <laughs> like, does it work? Yeah, it works. And now you look at it and you go, it doesn't work. You know, like, Hey, everybody's balling. Everybody's broke. Can, can you like tell you guys tell the difference? And it wouldn't be, you know, be, it would have been really easy to say, basically anybody can produce weed and it's really easy to get a permit and you have to make sure there's no EPA violations. And you're going to get in big trouble if you sell people poisonous shit, right? You could have done that. And then you could have said, mm, growing weed in and of itself is not something that you're going to go to jail for. But if you try to toss in a mega grow and you want to grow, you know, 15 tons of weed every run, well, we're going to fine you out of business. Cool. Right. Because that's not practical. And that it's the same as if you had like a fishery. 
and you have like there there historically there was a time in in the, in the Gulf of Mexico where the similar thing happened to what's happening to weed right now. People fished so hard that you couldn't catch a fish anymore. So now you have 10,000 boats and they all go out and they all come back out with three fish. It makes no money. It doesn't work. It's completely impractical. There's no point to it. There's no point to making bigger fleets because guess what? There's only a limited amount of something going on. In this case, it's such a renewable resource that the supply is not the issue. The demand is the issue. Mm -hmm. We're missing more secrets. Damn it. This one was good. It this is. Yeah. Well, I, he's right because demand is the issue. You know, people like us, we smoke frequently, but we also aren't the people in the rec store. The people in the rec store are occasional smokers at best. And when there's such a such a large supply, um, that causes all kinds of problems when you're growing acres and acres and acres of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like we really felt it here in California when the autos first hit because it created a another wave of herb and they just like they use I back. Um, Distros and middlemen used every category against every other category to leverage the prices down across all categories. And so like when the autos hit, they showed up and were like, oh, we were just offering, you know, 12, 13, 14, 16 for your depths. Price is 600 at best now because, well, the autos just came in. And right. people were like, yeah, but they're autos. They fucking suck. Oh, no, they're better now. They've changed. And it turns <laughs> out they fucking sucked. They're better now. I can make they, more money on them. Yeah, they just fucking filled up a whole bunch of distros inventory and then sat because nobody would fucking buy it. Well, the story I'm hearing out of California is the shops aren't even paying the growers in the first place. That's well, the that, that happens. I mean, That's so the, the entire... Yeah. Just take take all your product and then just don't give you anything, you know. And then it doesn't really matter if they're super profitable because guess what? It's all profit. There is no overhead because they don't pay their supply of shit, you know. Uh, that's old gangster. Say real quick okay. on the about the about the fish was that they they put a cap on what you could get. Everybody, every boat could only make. I can't remember what they said. You could only make a half a million dollars in profit a year. Oh you wow, know? financial. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So they basically said like there's a there's a cap right here of how much product you can actually take out. And what it turned out was there was a couple of companies who were actually it turned out were pulling out whatever 80 million dollars worth of fish or some shit every year, right? And they were the uh, ones who were fucking it for everybody. And all these little family fisher fishing operations that had been in business for years, they were making zero, right? And then the big guys were making zero too, which is kind of similar to what's going on. Now, there's probably not the biggest profits for a lot of the big guys either, only for some of the guys in the middle who are really smart. You know, there's people making money, but very few. So what happened was it only took, I can't remember what it was. I think it was like two or three seasons they did that. And then at a point, they were able to just lift it. And then uh, they lifted that cap and then they put it at something else that was that was lower, that, that was still a cap. But the cap was really high. The cap was like 10 or 10 million or something instead, you know? And so then all of a sudden it was like, okay, so this operation can make this. And I'm sure they found, people found workarounds and they said, oh, well, now we're making 10 million with this company, but we also have this other company. But every time you do that, there's, you still have to reestablish brand recognition and, and networks and all that kind of stuff to an extent. And uh, anyway, it, it was a success story. Basically, after a few years, they were all everybody was able to make money again. And it turned back into a thriving economy like it had been in the first place. And the original root um, of the issue was that they had been allowing people to just do whatever the fuck they wanted, you know, and and there's when there's a when there's a limited amount of something 
then it, it gets to a point where you have to be the very biggest and then it winds up being that thing of basically like everybody's peasants except for this one fucking royal family, you know? And then you wind up with these couple little things and it's like, okay, these guys are the guys who can afford to do it. And it, it takes it out of the hands of, uh, out of the, you know, the populace. And what's weird about it is that you just don't, you don't get a lot of like success for everyone like that, but to, you know, in capitalism, people are like, well, if you were really the beast, if you were really the big, the big guy, then you would just take over. And then it's just because you don't work hard enough. And it's like, yeah, to an extent. But at the same time, um, there's a certain point too where it becomes toxic. And it's like, no, it, it just, there isn't room for that. It, it, there's not even room for, you know, if you have like glass house, there's not room for just 10 other guys to go, well, let's be glass house too. Well, you got, there's literally no way, way for you guys to ever sell all that weed. It just doesn't, the numbers don't crunch. There's not that much weed consumption. And they're like, well, mm. so yeah, he'll come back. Um, but, uh, no, and we had that in 215 in a, a roundabout way. Um, in 215, there was a follow-up bill that was SB 420 that got passed, I think, in 2004. Um, you're back. Keep dropping science. I'll get back to what I was saying. Keep going with what you were saying, Jackson, if we've got you. I wonder he mentioned a delay earlier. I wonder if there's a slight 20 second delay I'll catch up for him. Um, or maybe he's frozen again. But uh, hopefully he pops back in here because he he was ready to pick right right up where he left off. How about, how about you, Trevor? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know where I'm at. So um, SB 420 got passed and he's going to, okay. Um, and it included in it a, there was a clause that said that all cannabis operations had to be uh, not for profit. And so you couldn't make profit and you had to stay small. And one of the main ways you could get fucked with back in the day was by making too much money and being too big, getting seen and getting either the IRS to come at you or law enforcement to come at you. And like all the dudes that went really big and showed a lot of cash were the dudes that got shut down back in the 215 era because it was there was like a threshold of money that you I was told it's not I don't know if this is for real, but it's like if you made over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, they were gonna come for your ass. Nine thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine. Yeah, so it was like Everybody who stayed under that and wasn't really showing crazy amounts of cash and was being, you know, a small operator was able to continue operating. People who got really big, really flamboyant, either their local authorities or federal authorities came to crack down on them. And that's just the nature of almost anything, too. It's like, don't don't be the big guy, because the big guy usually is the one that they make the example out of in, in these situations. So you know, under the radar is, is typically better. But uh, do you remember where you were, were, were headed with that last thought? Um, no, I mean, I just, it cut me off right when I was saying, uh, right when I was saying you can't have, you know, you can't just have unlimited giant, you know, and I understand like the promise of capitalism is great. And in a lot of things, it's fine, but there has to be some novelty in your business idea. You know what I mean? Like you have to be able to be like, okay, well, we are the ones who do it this way, or we are the ones who do it that way. And then there's room for people to be really big, you know, or even if you have like, you know, people hate Amazon because it's so huge. But the thing about Amazon is it's an, uh, it's a bigger umbrella where me or you, if we want to sell our shit on Amazon, it's basically it's basically a place for us to sell the things we want to sell too. And Amazon has made a lot of people, a lot of money, but that's not the way that it works when you're producing this thing 
that there's only only so many people can produce it and if and and the 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 barrier to entry is a lot of what messes it up too because mm -hmm. everybody like people are like oh well it, you just everybody can just sell your stuff it's like well but you can't the people can't sell their stuff the only people who can sell their stuff are people who already have a lot of money so it's a rich gets richer game you know what i mean like it's not like if you now like if you want to make make videos or music like you put it on youtube it's totally democratized like they you got rid of the of the conglomeration of all that right. kind of stuff. like you can really? succeed as the little guy in a lot of the models that have been these big monsters youtube's a monster google's a monster amazon's a monster but guess what you can really easily hack into that and piggyback on this monster and everybody can actually do really good and that was like the popularity of weed weed was a monster that everybody could piggyback on and go okay all right yeah like this this thing is popular this is the number one drug this is like you know everybody wants this and so it was really doable but then now it's like there's people who are allowed to use so much resources to do to to create this product that there's only the certain amount of demand for and then they are producing so much of it and it's not like you can just like show up at glass house and there's some big distributor and you can go hey i got this weed too like if you guys want to like slide this in with your order cool <laughs> you know like those are you know as like a weed guy if you know like big ballers and they grow thousands of pounds you're like cool i don't care i'm not gonna hate on you like when you run out hey you want to do some of mine or whatever and people have always done that kind of stuff and and, it, and it's all good but it gets to a point and, and i'm not blaming i'm not saying glass house is the one thing i'm just using this as an example because we know they're the biggest right and we also know that there's no way to sustainably create businesses mimicking theirs and have any kind of success it just isn't and 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 that's not me coming up with that concept it was literally written into the law that you cannot do that and these guys like d'angelo and a few other guys they got in there and they hacked into the law and said no 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 remove the cap remove the acreage cap and at first it was like everybody can only grow an acre and i was like cool Fair. everybody can grow that's an acre. reasonable then all of a sudden it's like, no, you can grow as much as you have the resources to make. So everybody has to just go, okay, pool our resources, make the biggest thing, crazy thing we can make. And then it just kind of shoots the whole thing in the foot because it doesn't, you know, it just, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work out. It's not just letting people be, it, it might've worked if, okay, let those guys biggest, Shoot, man. Um, dang. I mean, that's rough. But he's totally right. Like, so there was, and you're back. Let those dudes do that shit. Yeah. Let the, the, please. Uh, I was just, I was just saying, like, like it, it, when free is free, that's all good. You know what I mean? Like, if like if you guys want to be free to do this shit over here, but I have to be free to do that thing over there. And then you have real competition so, so that I can be the guy who has this, li this little thing. And I'm like, okay, but my quality is going to blow yours away. Yep. But it was really hard for a lot of people to get their foot in the door and they're not quite able to make it happen. And, um, and at the same time, like, I just feel like it's, it's just crazy because it are, it, it was already a working thing. If it was, if it didn't exist and you wanted to make it from scratch, I'd be like, well, cool, whatever. Everybody can just make what, what they want to make. And maybe a lot of people will just never start doing it. Just that there was already so much money being injected into the economy in this working model. And then they hamstringed it. You know what I mean? Like it was like a different, um, it's a weird situation and it, and it, it, was working and it could work and we know it worked and then they did some shit that didn't work and in my opinion it would be really good at this point to just be able to kind of turn it back around and is it too late i don't know because everybody said like the legalization is what crashed the market and i was like no the gray market was going to crash the market too when you really looked at it you're like there's already people who are growing so much weed 
So it was like one of these things where it was like, all right, well, they, they almost kind of needed to be some kind of a cap and some kind of regulation, but the way it's done just didn't, I don't know, it didn't work, you know? Maybe it was doomed. Maybe once everybody found out about it, it was just too, too many fucking people know. It's not, it's too accessible. So maybe we all just need to grow our own weed and there shouldn't be a weed market anymore. Let the economy fold. I don't fucking know. But I know that it was working. Cause it was, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was working. Was. We saw it working. So it, it's really cost prohibitive to get into it. And it's like the irony of, they say they, you know, they want it to be, you know, a free market or capitalism and let the, you know, the consumer choose the winners and the losers. That would be great, but that's not the case because Joe blow on the corner who grows that OG just stellar. And he's got 20 lights. He can't, he can't do this. So it's not a truly a free market. That's what I would love to see is really let the consumer pick the winner and the losers. Like you said, yes, get it tested. You do bad shit, bad things happen to you, but you can still do those things without having to spend a hundred thousand dollars for video cameras and eight foot fences and driveways, shit like that. So I, w I would love to see a truly free market. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that would be a good that would be a good start. You know, like initially, I was like, oh, don't worry about the acreage cap. Let everybody grow as much as they want. It's not going to compete with the little guys. But then, you know, the the little guys didn't didn't they didn't really get to be in there, you know, and. Uh, it was just there was a lot of people who were growing where it was like this is just this is not going to work you know but at the same time i don't know it's like i said like i i analyze it and analyze it and sometimes i get to a point where i'm kind of like fuck i don't know maybe it was just maybe it was just doomed you know like maybe that whole thing was just a weird a weird thing that happened and the reality is like we need to like my biggest thing now is I want to see more people operating completely outside of it to where it's like, you don't even really need money that much anyway, like grow food, try to do things more sustainably, more locally, like all that stuff, because it, it's real life. And uh, I, I think maybe this whole huge boom and then this whole huge crash is really more a symptom of the kind of psychosis that our cultures have created of thinking that we can just keep making everything be bigger and more and more centralized and all this and it's really kind of like you know what you guys kind of need to have your own you know like maybe the people who started all this weed shit in general were kind of like homesteaders and they were pretty self-sufficient and the weed was like real sought after and it kind of pumped a little bit of we, this is a good way to get a little bit of extra money, you know, and it got popular. Um, but that maybe that was what kind of, kind of poisoned it all in the first place was the, was the success of it. It just, I don't know, just a bummer. Cause we all watched it like really thrive and flourish and then just collapse. And it, it didn't really collapse fully until, you know, Cliffhanger. When did it collapse? Um, yeah, it, it, it is. So that, it, you're back. When did it collapse? Well, it was weird because it kind of collapsed. It kind of collapsed like right it, too early for it to have really been requied that made it collapse. Like I told everybody, I was like, the gray market killed the black market. Like it wasn't the, it wasn't the rec market that killed the traditional market. It was honestly like it was the medical market because what happened was the way that it was done, people were stacking medis and I knew people in Humboldt who were producing five and 6,000 pounds a week a year. And as soon as I saw that, I went, wow, a lot of people are going to do this. But I think that the time it really, really went downhill was when all these dudes who knew how to grow weed really well realized how easy it was to get a bullshit license up in Oregon 
and grow fucking a sea of mids and a sea of chronic too, you know? And then all that, that influx of that, that seemed to be when things really went down. It was just like this huge, huge amount all at once in, in Oregon and NorCal. It just kind of flooded out. Everybody's like, oh, we're growing hemp. And it was just these huge fields of weed. And um, I don't know. I mean, and that's why I look at like the way it was with like those fisheries where it's like you do too much doesn't work you know and you can't really convince people because somebody because people always go well everybody else is going to do too much so i should do too much too you know and how do you stop them from doing that i never told anybody like dude you shouldn't grow so much weed you're gonna fuck everything up but i mean i saw it and i think everyone saw it and a lot of people are like fuck everybody's about to grow too much weed the whole thing's gonna collapse so i better grow a whole bunch of weed too you know like everybody's going to eat everything on the table. So I better eat a bunch that's on the table too. And that's like, yeah, but you're only going to eat once, you know, but you can't, how do you stop it? It's human nature, you know, it's just like, it seems to be, seems to be just where we're at. And uh, like I said, like at this point, I try to tell people like, just don't even bother like trying to buy weed at the store, grow some bud maybe but everyone everyone here has kind of stopped focusing on um on trying to grow weed for money because it collapsed so bad it wasn't practical but it's weird because like i work at on um, like the third third week of the month wednesday and friday i work at the food bank here and a lot of my friends show up coming through at the food bank to get free groceries and i'm like you know like that's I'm, I'm glad that people are like, oh, they found out that there's some, like, it's, it's supplemental. There's this extra food. Here it is. Come by, pick it up. I tell everyone I know, I'm like, hey, pick up some groceries, like, get, get some stuff, you know? But it's the most weird, surreal thing because I, I know, I know some of these people have, like, been growing big dope, not huge, but like they were, they were able to do their thing, you know? cool people and and i'm like okay and if that's like that here then i know it's just kind of like that everywhere and you just see it all kind of kind of go down and then it's it's super weird too because i think that's happening a lot i think there's just a huge there's a huge downturn right now all over the place and i don't i don't know we're living in a weird time no matter how you look at it you know so and a lot of these growers you know have been pretty crafty pretty resourceful just almost by nature i wonder as this kind of pans out and people gets past you know kind of the initial shock of where is this going to turn what are they going to do is there will there be a resurgence of natural style farming or local markets or you know will they move away to the city and get a job in the warehouse you know what it'll be interesting to see how that ingenuity that has led these people to survive for so long, how that gets translated into the future. Yeah, and I, I see a lot of people like, I, I, you know, you don't, it's just like they said, it's just like I told people when when everyone was talking about like the, the legalization and things like, you know, how it's gonna, how it's gonna be different and people will be pushed out. And, um, you know, I was, I'm, I'm always more concerned about the people who are not as, um, who are not as hardcore like there's a lot of people who it's like yeah it's a great if you're if you're really like a gnarly person and you really miss you can really do good but also there's a lot of people who may be not well suited to do a lot of different things and they could have a little garden With the prices today, man, people really do need to start growing their own food. That's what I spent half my day working on was expanding the outdoor garden because, yeah, grow, grow some more food. Yeah, and I feel like in 215, there was a lot of just people doing whatever they could and figuring it out and kind of it almost feels like the reaction to 215 passing in California was like, cool, let's go. Let's see. Let's see how far we can push this envelope. Let's see what we can do. And 
the response to um, Prop 64 was instead like, hey, let's fuck it. Let's dump a lot of money into this thing and make a go of getting licensed and being in the regulated market. And then anybody who continued operating, most counties, like I said, sent code enforcement notices, started upping enforcement, and they didn't do enforcement the way that they used to do enforcement, typically speaking. It's not a lot of criminal, you know, you're not getting charged criminally, you're getting a code enforcement violation that gets $10,000 fines from the day, from the first day of violation, compounding every day until you cease violating. So people are looking at $70,000 fines in a matter of a week or something like it it's insane and so it to a certain extent legalization has been or whatever the fuck we call this prop 64 has been the most efficient means of eliminating the cultivation of just the mass general cultivation that was going on with tens of thousands of people you know fifteen thousand up in Humboldt, Mendo had, you know, near comparable numbers, if not even perhaps more. Trinity, Calaveras, nowhere on that scale, but we were in the thousands. And now my road, where it's exactly like Jackson was referring to, homesteaders, people who I remember the old timers, you know, me and my buddy got a 40 pound crop was like, yeah, we're fucking crushing it. We got a 40 pound crop, dog. And like, that's what you would brag about in the 90s. And so it provided some small supplemental and people were getting three, four, maybe even $5,000 if you had the absolute fire and knew the certain people that were paying for it. But like, you know, that was back then. A lot of that, I look out there now, I think there's like two, three grows that are just like personal for the head sort of grows where people are still holding on and doing it. And, you know, maybe they've got six, 12, like the biggest dude, I think has got like 18 or 20 plants. And like, I did that last year too, where I did 18 plants. And even then I felt sketched out where it's the first time I felt sketched out growing weed in years, but it was like, fuck, you know, technically I'm beyond the six plant limit or whatever it is. And I could get a code enforcement letter and all that stuff. And Plenty of people, like, independent of the code enforcement element of things that has had a huge impact in particular areas, the cost, the the collapse in the price of a pound, people talking about, like, you know, $300 pounds are like, fuck it. Like, no, it's, there's no point in growing anymore besides personal and head stash. But I'm, I'm shocked because my road, I've got a vantage point over my whole neighborhood I can see like everything and it's just like the dwindling of grows over the years has been crazy it's crazy when you see them popping off the map or off the grid i'd shed a little tear yep i mean you know it's it's uh it's a weird it's a weird thing man but you know, I don't know. I feel like we've gone on a, we've gone down a rabbit hole here of, uh, uh, we've turned, we've turned to a dark, a dark we, podcast we, here, you know. We, yeah, we're, we're, we're four hours and seven minutes Jesus. into it. So uh, maybe, maybe we should call it a night. We're getting close to it, but uh, we, 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 we should end, we should end on a, on a, positive note though yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you nailed it there so um for the positive note trevor are you doing outside again last year i saw you had some beautiful malawis that withstood like hurricane force winds i thought that was pretty entertaining seeing those things just freaking fly in the wind yeah um i'm growing more of the same stuff um uh the malawi ken some malawi wilson I've got uh, some Cuban black haze, Mauritius, Ethiopian um, that I'm growing out. That sounds tall. Super, yeah, no, they're wild. Um, very narrow leaves, uh, very high 
female to male ratio so far. I think mm -hmm. I'm at like four or five to one. Um, it was just a small little group of seeds. Um, and then I'm going to do some other weird haze things. I want, I want to try and keep things a little bit more uniform. Last year I had half long season weird crazy shit and then half the puck and like doing those together and like managing everything was not easy and um so yeah i'm doing doing all long season going to do a few fewer plants this year um just going to do 12 6 and 6 and uh yeah so that's that's my plans and i'm excited because it's weird shit i also have like a bunch of goofy side breeding projects that I'm going to try and do. Um, I, I believe I ended up with eight, maybe it was seven um, plants out of the Jodry Gold Star F5s, um, Jackson. So, you know, just going to open pollen all those, increase the population. And um, other than that, do some Afro Pips Malawi crosses to everything I can get my hands on. Yeah. Wow. I had a cool Malawi and last year I planted my last seeds of it. I think I could probably get more of them, but it was a neat one because it's been in Kauai for a long time. And I got it from a friend of uh, Kevin Jodry's uh, over in Kauai, this guy Don, and they were super, super cool. And um, I, I seeded them and the seed didn't take, and I don't know why the seed didn't take, but I screwed something up. And, uh, that rarely happens, but every once in a while you go to make something and you, you just watch and watch and watch and you're like, there's just no seeds in this, you know? And um, so for whatever reason, um, and uh, so I wound up losing that one and I'm hoping I can get them back because it was pretty cool. It didn't go super late when I grew them before. Um, but this year I did try to do a bunch of, uh, a bunch of cool, I don't tend to do um, a lot of, a lot of that uh, late season stuff, but I'm gonna do some and I'm hoping I can, I don't even know if the way the timing is, I don't even know if it'll work out that if I dep them, they'll be any earlier because they're they're so small now that they'll probably won't sex and they'll probably sex only a little bit before um, they would normally want to start noticing the days get shorter so I, maybe i'll get them to finish a couple weeks earlier or something but i'm mostly doing them um to find some cool plants get an idea of what they are and clone maybe a couple of them out of there and make a little bit of seed and you know you can make seed and have your seed mature a little bit before um before they actually finish i'm not actually trying to necessarily grow them to get good finished weeds. So at least if I can get an idea of what they are and do a little preservation. So I have like, Bodhi gave me the the metal haze and I was interested in that. Um, and then I have, uh, what's it called? I can't remember what it's called. I think Eden Transmission. It's Viet, Vietnamese seven cross uh, Afghani. He gave me those. And I have some, Gorilla Glue Cross Mango Haze that I got from uh, from uh, Chris at Source Genetics, my buddy, uh, OG Cushman. Those are like his crosses, the male that he used to make those, that was the Mango Haze, was like an old one. It's super, super dank. There's like really, really cool, like crazy highs with crazy like citrusy, fruity profiles in there. Um, without the terpinaline and it's just like really potent. And then he, and then uh, I did, I did a bunch of them. I did, I did a lot more, a lot more like narrow leaf hybrids and, and uh, peers than I normally do. And right now I can't, I'm trying to remember which ones I actually popped already, but um, damn it. I know I did those ones and I, I did a few more and then I did like I planted like 99 uh, root beer S1s and I planted some different things from people that are kind of all over the place and uh, some Cherry West back cross fours to find a cool male out of that to keep around hopefully 
and a bunch of old cherry limeade lines that um, some that I've already done that I know are good and some that I'm trying new and uh, a whole bunch of, I mean, I don't know, I should have lists somewhere, but there, I did a whole bunch of them and I'm basically just going to kind of look through them and then try to, if I find any males that seem really promising, I'm just going to throw them under the lights and just keep them in veg, you know, and then, uh, grow out the females and see what they look like. And if I really like the groups of females, then I'll know, okay, I want to really want a male from this group. If they're consistent enough, then the male's a little more predictable. And then I'll know that I want to keep it. And then um, from things like the metal haze, I'll probably just keep the males that I have in veg and then um, bud the females and re-veg my favorite. And then, uh, you know, try to do some kind of a thing with that. Like I'm trying to like keep some cool plants around looking through these weird things and then be able to have the clones so that early next year I can put out these super long flowering things and just like bud them all through the spring and the summer and get like really prime time instead of trying to milk them and run them super, super long and late. Cause the spring was so late here this year. It was all snowy and shit all the way till May or something. So um just doing that that's kind of what i'm looking at this year and then i'm about to do i'm going to attempt to um do a cool reversal and i've never done a reversal so i'm going to try to pull that off and do um something something and he'll be back in three seconds to tell us indeed something that's good. That's, that's a lot going out. That's interesting, man. I like uh, watching him hunt. Okay, so you're putting out a couple of something? Uh, I was just trying, I'm, I'm trying to do like a cool femme breeding to have like a cool thing of like a lot of my stuff and some other cool ones. And then, um, you know, see if I see if I pull it off. And then I have backup males in case my, my donors don't reverse good. Because um, I haven't reversed it. And I haven't reversed anything. It's not what I do but I'd like to do it. And mainly I wanted to make, I wanted to self this plant. And I was like, well, if I self it, I might as well, I have a bunch of them. So I might as well just reverse, you know, this whatever, you know, dozen plants that I have. And then, um, and while I'm making S1s, go ahead and put a bunch of other stuff with it. And if it works, it works. And if not, then I have a really good lime mail that I've cloned that I've kept for a couple of years that came out of, um, out of lime one cross uh lime one cross three boys is what i call it which was um lime one crossed with a male that was its brother and then i popped those seeds and i back crossed it again onto lime one i grew a bunch of those and i had i think a couple hundred plants and then i only found one plant that looked just like lime one mm. and and I, it turned out to be a male and I went, all right, well, I'm going to keep this thing. And I tried it and it made bread back with the lime one for a back cross too. It made a way more consistent lime one seed than I've been able to get with other males. So okay. uh, I, I know it's a pretty cool one. And then, you know, I'll try that. And if those work out to be good, then I'll release some of them and work some of them further and stuff. And so that's kind of, that's like the, the run that I'm about to do right now. Like I'm about to basically put the, put the reversal plants and flip them. And then in a maybe five days or something that I'll go ahead and flip the male clone of the line. And then I'll flip the females in, you know, uh, about two weeks and then mm -hmm. everything will be staggered to be able to, to be able to, uh, get it. Um, you know, and no matter what, I know the try male, to get it to drop at the right time. Yeah, and I know the males will work no no matter what. They're beautiful right. too. I'll get some pictures of those up on my IG because it's a really pretty plant. Um, um, are you making your reversal sauce in house or using a uh, commercial? No, I got. I actually got the spray from from uh, Crane City, um, and and they've been using kind of everybody's spray, and then. Um, working on their own spray 
And he said that he preferred it to all the ones that he could get and try. Um, it leaves the plants looking healthier and, uh, and had success reversing plants that he couldn't get to reverse well with the other sprays that, you know, people use. And um, so I was like, cool, that sounds good. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll try to try uh, theirs out because he does a lot of reversals and he's, he's well versed in it. And he's tried the ones that I would have tried. And he was like, this one works better. And it wasn't because he was trying to sell me something or anything. It's just like this is you know this side by side this one worked and the other ones yeah. didn't so um know, <laughs> give it a give it a whirl and you know hopefully i can time it right make it work and pick a cool plant and you know we'll see uh we'll see if that works and then if if not i'll have this killer line crossed with all the clones that i keep so those are all every time i find a real cool lime mail and I cross it with a lot of stuff. I wind up with some winners and some that I, you know, that I don't like. And uh, I'll at least have some cool stuff to, to come out of a run. Cause it sucks if you do a whole run. Like I have a hoop. It's like a nine by 80 hoop. I'm going to wow. see the whole. So if you like wind up, you know, if I wow. fail with, with the reversal, then it'll be like, I can't, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, I have to have my backup mail. And I almost just did, I almost just did the little self with the other one that I want to use. Uh, but I was like, but I have a lot of plants of it, so I might as well try it. And then if they look like they're doing good pollen, then, um, then I'll go ahead and take those and stick them in there with, with them. And, you know, we'll see if it, see if it works out cool. So that's the, that's the deal. And then all those, sativas and stuff are just kind of like the sideline things and i'm going to try to keep cool plants out of them without having to do anything with their pollen keep the keep the females cleaned up and checked all the time and keep the males just in veg you know and then um whatever comes out the most promising from the females then i'll already have re-vegged from them and then i'll have the clones just kept in veg, the the males just kept in veg, you know. And then, if I if I want, like in the fall, and everything's already done, I can go ahead and and try to uh, reverse those males and see what they're really yeah. holding to. Reverse a copy of them if I want. It gives you a lot of potential, you know. We'll see if I can, um, see if I can do some cool shit with those because there's I got a whole bunch, and it was one of the years where I went in and I was like, okay, what do you what's in the collection that you really want to see? And so right now I have like, I don't know, a couple, maybe a couple thousand going and I'm just going to try to make something happen with those, you know, and then do my big clone thing too, that I know is more reliable. And that's what's, that's what's happening. So that's, sure. that's a lot of clones. Yeah. Clones. I, the clones <laughs> themselves, I have like uh that hoop, I think it only it only holds about 120 clones. There's like three, three nice bushes of everything. Some of them six, some of them ten. Like I have some really cool NL five hazes that Skunk Tech ran through a whole bunch, and he cloned uh, all of them. And then I smoked all the weed for a while, and then I ended up picking the 13 and the 26. And the 13s like more plain northern lights with the real crazy frost but it gets me high as fuck sometimes like sometimes i'll smoke and be like oh this is cool this is nice up weed and then sometimes i'll smoke and be like oh man i don't know how to work this submersible pump like all i gotta do is plug it in but what was the right how far was i supposed to fill this and what was you know like think everything and i'll be like this shit this is good weed right here like this is not the normal thing like my brain is like really not not doing what I'm, you know, it's like, just, you're like, this is different. I'm different right now. You know, real head change on that one, the 13. And then the 26 is like really good, like party weed. Like you smoke it at a party and you like give it to somebody who's not used to smoking anything with any of that, like sativa influence to it. And then oh, no. smoke it, smoke it, smoke it. And then be like, what do you think of that weed? And they're like, fuck, I'm really fucking high. Got really stoned, you know, and like, 
you know it's just funny because you're not you, if you smoke all the time you're not used to something different so it's like smoking vacation weed or something right. but the buds on that just get huge like like a really good like jack hybrid you know because it's kind of in the nice. ballpark but um but super cool the buds are just so big and beautiful on the 26 and then the 13 is just like that when it's grown indoor it's like the old northern lights that i had where it's just turns white it's just so resinous you know and and, it, and it's not fake resin it's really good at potency and shit so i those ones i have i have like 10 of those of the 13 in there and so it'll get crossed with something and um you know then i have like a lot of classics in there stuff of mine weird stuff and you know diesel and uh pk and you know a bunch of the cool regular staples that produce a lot of cool shit so things that you would be bummed if you didn't have access to them one day yeah for sure for sure <laughs> and uh, i've been doing like i've been doing the i took like i was like animal is a really slow growing plant pk if it's not in prime health it's kind of hard to root um few other ones that i have that are like slower like afghani things that i'm just like it's kind of i don't know something wrong with them and i just did a round of testing on all of those ones and i'm just stoked because like they're all clean which means they've always been clean which means all the shit that i made with them in the day like it's not because at a certain point i was like well pk is finicky as fuck like what if it has hop latent and i used it to make Lime one and I used it to make Sky Cuddler Kush and KD and Sky Cuddler Double Kush and what if the it's all running in there somewhere because it all came from this and then I finally got to test the the PK that I've used for everything and it was like no it's clean it's just OG it's just a finicky plant you know and uh, it's just cool to see you know because you want to not be fucking that stuff up too bad yeah well no that's that's really good to hear because i mean if there's anything i've taken away from today i'm like oh my god that shit is everywhere because like i haven't taken a clone in over 10 years just because i try to minimize my stuff but i do take seeds and it to today with all the panels it really got me wondering you know obviously i don't see anything but in that box of seeds do i have something with it is it just a matter of time until I get to it? So that's cool. You were able to uh, get that confirmation for yourself and for others. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah, all that information is crazy because then you realize like, okay, cool. I pop all these seeds. Then basically before I ever take them and put them too close and how I do, how you deal with them and everything like you, you or before you make seed. Nope. But yeah, no, I, if you ever get something that's really cool, it's like, okay, if it's going to be a parent that's going to be used now, like I'm going to have to go ahead and test it. And it's not a big deal because, you know, you don't have to release a million things so they can come from, uh, they can come from clean moms, you know? Yeah. And that's cool. I'll be waiting for the day to where we can get some sort of home testing or even, you know, just, what I understand roots roots is a good place to look at it roots and then some of the leaf tissue, but, yeah. uh, as a private citizen, non, you know, I don't have a commercial license in this state, so I can't get cannabinoid or terpene testing. Oh, yeah. I, I, I can't do anything here. Yeah. Kind of sucks. Yeah. Uh, for home testing, at least for the, for the, um, for the hop there, uh, I know they're working out. I know Toomey is working on like a home test kit and they've been like, they've been tinkering with the lamp testing, which makes stuff really easy. But like initially, like uh, we were doing testing with a lab here down in the North Bay that was using lamp testing. And they were like, this one's dirty, that one's clean, this one's dirty, that one's clean. And it was like, okay, well then, you know, these like which ones of these are actually worth keeping and trying to find somebody to tissue culture or whatever You're still trying to figure out like how everything works it turned out all said and done that they were giving people a lot of false positives you know so you could really easily be like oh there's all this stuff it's all dirty 
It's like, well, no, it's not. So everybody who's been using those particular labs that are using faulty, faulty, you know, regents or whatever they're doing that doesn't work in their technique, it's like, they're fucking everybody and they're not gonna give your money back once you tell them their shit don't work. And after a while, you start to realize like, just the way that they would like approach things and describe, they'd be like, well, we think that it was a bad batch of Regent because the control came out negative, but then this other one, these came out positive and it was not supposed to. So, I mean, so you're like, so when you did these whole rounds, like you're gonna refund everything. Well, no, you know, you're like, well, fuck you guys then, you know, I'm not gonna use, use your stuff. And I don't wanna like, you know, like I don't, I don't wanna like say, like, you know, whose stuff they were using and everything, but it was, it was lamp testing and it was not being done properly and it was costing a lot of fucking money, you know? I spent some money and it didn't get anything for it. And initially I thought I did. I thought, oh, okay, well, this one's dirty and that one's dirty and this one's dirty. And I had a couple, I was like, well, I'm gonna go ahead and keep them anyway. But now I got to keep them over here and not have them with everything. And I got to make sure it's all done separately. It's a huge pain in the ass. And then it turned out that like, no, it's not the case at all. They're false positives. And you can tell when you start getting actual uh, uh, qPCR testing because it like tells you how much there is. And if it's there and you do the roots and the roots is so much more indicative of whether or not there is infection and then you go no these are clean and then you look at the ones that actually were dirty and you go well yeah those are the ones we knew were dirty there's only a couple of them and they were so obviously dudded and these other ones that we were like this doesn't really seem like it's dudded but we just tested everything and then you go no it's bullshit and uh so i don't know i've i've, I've been happy with Toomey as a lab to me genomics and uh, their turnaround super quick. And once we knew like, okay, this is dudded, this is dirty. We actually use that as our own control to test the testing, to be like, okay, here it is, here it is, here it is. Dirty, dirty, dirty. Okay, here's this, clean, clean, clean. Okay, give them the dirty one again, dirty. Okay, these ones, okay, clean, clean, clean. All right, give them the dirty one again, dirty. You're like, okay, all right, so this works. But with the other thing, it was like, no, sometimes they would say that one was clean and sometimes they'd say these other ones were dirty and you don't know, you know? So we were like, all right, hang on to the one that's dirty and let's use that the same way they would in the lab. Knowing it's your control, yeah, it's it's we're doing control. It. We know this fucker's dirty. And every time that's the only dirty one, you oh. know? Okay. And then you go, okay, cool. So you know you get an idea of what's what's really going on you know and i i wouldn't tell everybody just kill every i had that plant it was one of my favorite plants sweat i kept it for i think i kept it for like two years knowing it was dirty dramatic pause I was hoping they would come back in real quick like that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So you kept sweat for two years because you knew it was so, dirty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I made some seeds and put the seeds away and I can take those seeds and I can look through them and do them in their own separate area and, and go ahead and look for the ones that I know are the ones I want. And then out of the ones that I want, test those ones and see which ones of those are clean and then take the clean ones and breed them together. And then okay. in theory, what comes from the two clean parents should be clean seeds. And then you can test them one more time and see if that's how it really is. And then be able to go, okay, cool. Now I have a seed line I got from this dirty clone and it's good. But what a lot of people are doing right now is they're telling everybody, give me all your clones, what's hot, get all this shit, go stand in line and buy cuts and do all this stuff, hit them with a bunch of pollen and drop the seeds. You yeah. know, not only are they untested for what they're going to be, which some people don't mind.
but some, some of these people it's it's going to be you're going to it's going to be like 100 it's going to be untested like it's not clean people you know i see people like i put up the post today about the the, the info on here there's people on there that are like oh whatever you know like people don't believe in it and i'm like well you know it's a real thing like it does exist and when like i had that plant that i liked so much it went from being a plant that i saw rookies root in six or seven days to be in one where you could have everything just perfect and it would take you three weeks to root and that might not matter i still was getting pretty good weed off of it but it wasn't quite right and i was wondering why is it not quite right the weed is not quite what it's supposed to be and with really really good weed a slight difference is a big difference right when it's not quite the magical unicorn mm -hmm. weed that it used to be you're like well fuck now it's like it's cool but it's not <laughs> it that's not what it really that's not what i like about it and then all of a sudden when you go to root it and it's really hard to root and a lot of them don't root and the ones that do root take three to four times as long to root like you can't tell me that's not an important thing do you just want all your plants now you can just count on them taking a month to root like fuck that yeah. i want my plants to be healthy i don't want shitty plants i'm not going to keep <laughs> them around and limp them along hoping that there's something good to do with them i'm killing those ones and i want to have clean ones that are good because there's a lot of stuff you know so that's uh why it's good that like to have a guy come on and all the information that i saw on the that the guy was on talking this morning from what i know from experience it was everything that i know to be true and some stuff that i had wondered about that i suspected like the seeds being able to be dirty i was like nice. probably. and then there's confirmed like okay here's the studies i've been waiting for to to come out with those studies and he was the first time i heard it because i haven't been checking back constantly you know yeah. but um anyway it's cool cool uh cool knowledge to be out there it is i bet i bet it's uh and you've, you've been doing this long enough that your intuition is is pretty good but still when those dots connect i bet that's got to feel good still yeah for sure i mean like you know when you look at you look at this plant and you're like why is it not why is it not the thing anymore you know like maybe this one has that shit they're talking about yeah you know i tested it five times five out of five five out of five dirty I'm not going to believe one, I'm not going to believe two, I'm not going to believe three, you know, five tests. And it's like, they're all dirty. And all the rest of it's clean. And I was like, all right, well, cool. Then fuck. You know, and I wanted to get it cleaned up and everything, but I never did. And, you know, it is what it is. I ended up, I ended up, why did I lose it? Because it didn't root. I took my last wave of cuttings off of it. And I'm everything roots. I'm getting roots popping up on all these different things. So I know everything's going perfect. Cool. The plants that I had, they were just like limping along. They weren't doing that good. They could never really, they didn't ever really thrive the way they were supposed to in this particular last round when I had this plant. And uh, partly due to my fault, but the other ones that I treated this way, they all did fine. All of a sudden, boom, I'm popping roots on everything. These plants, they start to get really bad. I go, fuck this. These things are, I'm getting rid of these things. Get rid of them. I'm like, I have, a, I have this tray of cuts. Everything else is rooting. These are going to take a while longer to root. They just all died in the tray. And I was like, good fucking riddance because I've already bred it. And I have the seeds put away and I, I'm just tired of having a dirty plant off in the, in the side in its own little place, taking care of it and constantly going, okay, I always, I can never touch it. Right. I can't do, it's just this fucking leper over here of a plant, you know, I was like, get fucking rid of it, man. And now it's gone <laughs> and tested all the rest of my stuff and all my stuff is clean. I'm super stoked. It was well worth it, you know? Yeah. So anyway, yeah. that was my experience with it. It's hard to get rid of the the, the emotional attachment sometimes, but they're plants. Okay, we got to do it, man. Yeah, and I got it back accidentally. It wasn't supposed to be it. it was supposed to be something else, and it was like a miracle that I and I've been oh, looking shit. for it forever. But while I had it, I bred it with three different things, and I have those seeds put away. And like I said, I'll plant them and test them, and I'll have more yep. clean stuff, and it'll I'll bring it back. You know, it's in there. Good. Well, I feel yeah, we we with 
the damn dirty virus we've got down another dark hole. So maybe well, maybe no. before we sign off, I know something that's going to make people know, happy. So. Yeah. Something that'll make people happy is what are you releasing, man? Do you have anything coming out soon? Releases. I have a little bit of stuff. I'm going to release a little bit of the, um, I got, I did the Sour Dub Cross OG, OG Jaro. Those are really cool um, cushions that people have liked that I gave them to. I'm just going to put out a little bit of those. Um, what else do I have? I have some other, some other stuff I'm going to put out. Uh, I'm trying to think what are the next ones I just got them together of what what actually I knew was proven out to be good uh god damn it let me see if I can find them real quick yeah no worries uh I had a cool one the purple snow bubba from CSI um i got as a freebie i think okay randomly i don't even think i got that from from csi but it was a uh, purple urkel bubba and the snow and the snow Whoa. and i grew those and they were like really cool um really hashy gnarly and i i hit those with the gelato 33 cherry limeade mail that i keep that i still have those came out good I'm gonna put out some of the GSL cross with the Lime F5. Those came out really nice. Um, and then uh, a little bit of one that I gave away as freebies that people have been really liking. People have kept them as keepers and running them for for production because it's just uh, such a you know people like it for the market because it's the it's the the hype with a little twist of of extra flavor the runs with the same mail the gelato cherry limeade i'm going to put out a couple packs of those um and then i don't know a few more but those are ones that i just i just had some stickers made up for the packs of those so nice. very yeah, cool i know uh dave's not here speaks very highly of that gelato 33 times cherry limeade he's like everything it touches is magic so he enjoys that one it'll be nice for him to have another one to add to the collection there yeah they're good i i, I made it as a as a goof and i was just like ah, we'll see you know and then i was like i don't know it's pretty it's pretty good you know you never know what you're gonna get when you just cross things that are yeah. in the ballpark if they're just gonna wash out and suck or but they, they did, it did good and it's good. They have cool highs and stuff too, you know? So. And how about you, Trevor? Is, is two buck Chuck, uh, is he making a comeback this summer? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Peter's actually got a lot of the, um, the Pina hash plant crosses we made. Uh, we ran out probably about, I don't know, many thousand of them uh, at my buddy, land hammer uh his wow. grow and it was direct so from seed okay. into the beds um wow. and i think they were planted between july and like late july early august and um we were really impressed uh it was there was a donny burger an oreos pina hash plant um uh, watermelon Z, uh, fatso, uh, GMO root beer, <laughs> and uh, a number of other things. And the pina terps came through in every single one of them. Um, there's decent washers in them. There's definitely some CBD in the spectrum. So um, just a, a full mix of all, like multiple different the oreos the donny burger the watermelon z all the different crosses and different phenos from all the different crosses all mixed together produced um some rosin that when it was tested um came back i can't remember the numbers off the top of my head exactly it was relatively high in thc like i can't remember it was 40 50 somewhere around there percent of thc and then 20% CBD and fucking really nice terps. A lot of a wide range of sort of a few oddball terps in there. 
and because the osamine basically um and so yeah it's nice it's got that pineapple turf that comes through and everything and those will be available um through peter actually because cool. he's got all of those the full lineup um i just need to get some labels down to it yeah, he, so. says, he says i need info on those to put on the site yeah the, well mostly the, the data entry levels. is his favorite stuff Re record breaking yeah. osamine levels that's <laughs> all you need to know the, 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 the pina is like the highest in, in that that's what the the tropical sleigh ride and those other ones like that that had been like the the crazy ones the emerald cup that comes from that from yeah. that penis yeah but so that's the osamine definitely comes through in these um they've been grown out and tested in the field at least in a single season sort of crop and yeah they show out and the oath, like he said, that that pina just it stomps on everything. And if you're looking for some osamine pineapple turps, two buck chucks, you know, Peter, whenever I get him the info and the stickers, it'll slap. Slap. I love it. You kids and your new fangled languages. No. <laughs> oh, sure. Anything, uh, any last words from you, uh, Jackson? I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Dutch Bloom's uh, Regenerative Seed Co. He's got some packs right now of my stuff um, that maybe you could find somewhere, but I think he's got, uh, he's got some stuff right now that's not not really around um cool so if you're looking for stuff he's got some stuff uh peter occasionally has some stuff um speakeasy seed bank has has a little bit of stuff right now um but uh yeah tap in with uh with dutch and he's running a whole bunch of stuff too testing it out right now so he'll wind up if stuff comes out real good he'll wind up having maybe some other some other on odd, oddball stuff and he's got uh he's got reproductions right now of the root beer freeze stuff that he worked for a couple generations to uh go in the direction of of what he likes and um i don't know what else is going on but uh yeah badass man Badass. Thank you for uh, rushing, you know, or getting right back from what you're doing in the day and then hopping right on with us for, you know, three hours. I appreciate that. Everybody yeah. always loves, everybody loves hearing from you, man. So definitely don't cool. be a stranger here. <laughs> yeah, it's no biggie. I get a lot of breaks because my internet's so fucking bad, you know? So I don't actually have to go on that long. I've been on for, you know, three hours, but it's <laughs> only on here for about an hour and a half. It's shit. Yeah. It's my I got the fucking I got Starlink, but it's on my on my roof and I need to run it way out to the meadow because where the trees are, it basically drops me out every ten or twenty minutes for like fifteen seconds or something. So it doesn't matter for like streaming everything. It's just uploading shit you know on with this kind of stuff it just every once in a while it's drops in yeah. it, but you know that's what the thing is and uh and uh, uh hats off to you trevor five hours this evening plus a whole bunch of shows today um gold stars brother <laughs> gold stars <laughs> gold star. yeah and gold stars to everybody in chat too you guys you guys have been hanging out doing awesome oh, yeah yeah um, uh, well thanks for having me on guys and thanks everybody for watching and in the chat and talking shit and checking shit out and uh you know i gotta jam out but um i hope everybody has a good night and uh and uh thanks for uh checking out all the ranting and raving about <laughs> weed and the dark rabbit holes and <laughs> the, uh, the we pulled it out at the end we pulled it out <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> cool all right i'll hit the broadcast button take it easy everybody we'll catch